Good evening. Uh, this is uh, the Chicago Computer Society January meeting of the Lennox SIG. We're going to have a light turnout because uh, I made a, a, a mistake. Uh, I was so tied up yesterday that I forgot to get out the uh, announcement. I thought of it uh, uh, and got it out, followed up with a phone call, and the person uh, we rely upon getting the uh, an uh, invite uh, sent out uh, was not apparently available. Then I, I got a message from uh, Peter. Uh, I wonder if you can get in uh, with uh, uh, the prior month's uh, yes, uh, yes. link, which he did. Uh, I got a hold of Bert to send out uh, the message. And then uh, uh, right uh, before the uh, meeting was uh, uh, to open up uh, for anybody uh, who was an early bird, uh, ended up uh, disappearing on my system and apparently everybody else's system, and uh, uh, or at least most other people's systems. So I had to have Bert send that out again. So it looks like we're going to have one real thin meeting tonight. That's nothing I can do about that. One thing that I want to uh, uh, start off the meeting with is uh, a Q&A for uh, people who uh, have a problem or uh, uh, have uh, some kind of announcement, uh, uh, information, uh, that other people may be interested in. Anybody got anything? Boy, the noise is deafening. Okay. Uh, in that case, I'll get into the meat of the uh, meeting and see if I can... Let's see here. Get into that. Share that. But I gotta do some hiding. And okay. Now uh, what I have uh, this evening is a, a series of uh, videos. Now, I'm not going to ask you guys here, uh, but uh, part of the announcement was if anybody uh, uh, that was joining is uh, uh, not up on a Linux yet, if they had a, 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 a issue, uh, maybe we could help them out and get them uh, uh, going on a Linux uh, distro. But not having any uh, uh, newbies uh, here tonight, uh, we'll uh, forego that, and hopefully they'll show up next month. Uh, I'm going to start off with uh, uh, this video here. And... Come on. Oh, good old YouTube um, is going to drive me nuts. I probably had a couple of days on it, but um, I wasn't really even noticing it. I got another problem. So we weren't too surprised. Oh, it should be sharing its own. Our daughter had it, and they. I think Bob Baxter's audio is yeah. interfering a little bit. Uh, Somebody's got something going on in the background. Yeah, but uh, at the moment, uh, even on here, uh, you know the carefulness and all of that. I'm not getting sound out. Um. Yeah, but. I don't know. I, think I presume you're sharing with the video sound enabled, etc. in Zoom. Mm -hmm. And I presume you have Zoom, five, what is it, 517.5 that just came out? No, I don't have five. I got two. Oh, 
Well, I didn't it should have work. time. Didn't have time it should to upgrade. Work. It should work. I know. I almost didn't have time either. Walk it on. I know I didn't have time. But it's uh 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 he's counting them up. Last year she had I think ten lab tests that showed she was possible. Three? And I'll talk about the new feature. Yeah, okay. Okay, we're hearing it. Yeah. Hello um, folks and welcome. Linux Mint 21.3 has been officially released. Cinnamon Mate XFCE. Today's video is going to be filmed in 1920 by 1080. It certainly looks very nice in 4K. Uh, however, I'm going to spare you the smaller icons. Um, you are watching this on Linux for Seniors. If you'd like to subscribe, the icon will be there in the corner. 300 videos and growing. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the new version of Linux Mint 21.3. I'll also talk a little bit about upgrades. If you wanted to do the upgrade from 21 to 20. 21.2 to 21.3 and I'll talk about the new features and give you a couple of tips along the way. So I'll start off with the website. You can click the Mint 21.3 from here. You can also download it from here. So you can click that from here and it gets you to, to the same page. I wanted to let you see that um, 21.2 has an Edge version and this one currently does not. This, when you download it fresh, it will be a 515 series kernel. And if everything works on your machine, stay with it. But I will show you where the 6 dot something kernel. You have a 6.2 and a 6.5, similar to the Edge version for newer hardware. Okay, so download it in this section if you like. It is a three gigabyte download. The requirements are for bare minimum stuff. X amount of RAM, I have plenty, but more importantly, four gigs is recommended. 100 gig drives are recommended, disk space in other words, and something better than 1024 by 768. Okay. If you are upgrading, in the last couple of days, you've probably seen a lot of updates. You went through and you updated everything. Today is Saturday the 13th. You should go to your edit and find that little symbol in here that says upgrade to 21.3. While I'm still in here, view Linux kernels. The Linux kernel that ships with uh, the standard version if you download it fresh is 5.15. 5.19 is obsolete. 6.2 is available and I'm currently using it. You can install it in other words. You can go as high as 6.5 and install that. Okay, if the 515 is working for you, great. I wouldn't mess with it. Just wanted to let you know where they are. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the installation procedure. You downloaded the ISO. It's roughly 3 gigabytes. It does support the BIOS, EFI, and Secure Boot. It has a couple of tools also installed. Uh, before you install it, um, there's Gparted for repartitioning your drive. There's a boot repair and also time shift. Time shift is also a very good idea to activate during your installation process if you haven't done so already. Time shift is found on the installation media, so you can do a system restore instead of installing everything from scratch. Please remember that. I've heard these nightmare stories too many times. Somebody kicks themselves and they, you know what, because they forgot all about that tool and they had to reinstall all of their applications. Always a good idea to check those things. Now let me talk a little bit about what's new. So Hypnotics Player, Custom Channel, and a lot of improvements under the hood. The Cinnamon version 6 has four different types of spices. You're looking at one of them right now. This is called a Desklet. These are applets and there's more. I think there's a little bit more in the applets list that was available from the previous version. There's also extensions and you're looking at one of them. This is a semi through panel bar and that's extensions and that's the name of it. You can get it from downloads. This is also new. This is called actions and it's uh, basically a summary of a lot of little things that interacts with your system. And you also have a download section also. Okay. The um, display, scaling, 
you can have your display clicked here or right clicking on your panel and open that up here. I'll open it from here. You can see that I'm filming in 1920 by 1080 with 100 or 200% scaling. If I flip this over to 4K, I have four sections now. Your graphic card and monitor may be slightly different. If you want to boot into the Wayland environment, you do that from the login screen. All you got to do is look for this logo right here. I'll show you what it looks like. Looks like that one right there on your login screen. Okay. I'll come back to some of these other tips. You have new artwork now. Backgrounds, in other words. It's, the folder is called Virginia. And I'll just give you some of the examples. I'm using one of them. This one is Corsica, the one that's running in the background. This one here is from Iceland, my home country. That's a puffin. And a couple of other. This one's for Bulgaria, Slovenia. Lots of beautiful, beautiful backgrounds or wallpapers. Just to give you some examples. Okay. So I'm going to to continue using that, you can certainly bring in your own photos too and use them as wallpaper. And you can change back to the old original black and white ones if you don't want to tolerate the photos, as one would say. And don't forget about the play backgrounds as a slideshow. That tool is still available. It's a wonderful tool in my book. It just starts cycling through the images of whatever folder you left this in. It doesn't matter. It'll just keep cycling through these, including your own photos. Okay, I'll switch back. I'll turn this back off. Turn this one back on. All right, so um, I talked about the Linux kernel being here. If you decide to go do that. Okay, again, you have some options to think about. And um, then I'll just talk about the general features at this point. All right. First of all, you can resize this box to your heart's content. It's pretty versatile. If you don't like the size of the icons, maybe they're too small for you. Right click on this one, hit configure, and then change these numbers. I just recommend screenshot tools when you do this, though. That would be an SC in here. The tools available to you in three modes. Okay. If you don't like the black and white icon, you can certainly pick other colors in here if you like. Okay. And the cinnamon icon again. During your login screen. Okay. So anyways, you can also put text in here if you got, if you want to put text. The super key, if you got one of those, or start key or windows key, opens up the menu. All right, so don't forget, you can resize the icons. You can also do that to the menu. Here's a quick tip for placing icons over here and down on the panel. I don't recommend them dragging them onto the desktop. If you do, you'll get a remnants like this. What you want to do is right click and do that. How do you get rid of this? Because you're going to find this funny. When I open up my file manager, you can still see that blue box. It's okay. Right click on your panel bar. I'm going to reset cinnamon while I'm still filming and I'm not going to edit this video. The blue box is now gone. Let me continue. So these are your menus. I'm just going to quickly go through them. I'm going to make this as tall as possible so you can see all the goodies in here. Just to let you see what's in the menus. Okay. And I have lots of videos on web apps. If you uh, wonder what that tool does, it makes web based icons. You don't need any coding skills. I'll show you exactly what to do if you watch one of my videos. LibreOffice is 7.3. Calendar. Go full screen. And more importantly, you have online accounts you can tie into your Google Calendar. And if you do, this will populate the events in here. Okay, and you can also manually plug those in if you like. Um, where did I leave off? Calendar. Sound and video, I added simple screen and VOC. Uh, rhythm box, uh, if you put in songs in your music folder, it'll auto populate in here. There's that uh, Hypnotics TV player, the one that they upgraded. And uh, admin tools, this one uses um, TAR for backups. 
I also have uh, regular videos on all kinds of different backup uh, solutions for you. Using TAR, using RSync, that kind of stuff. Software Manager, Synaptic, and Terminal are three ways to install software. I'll start with Synaptic, but just remember you can use Terminal to install software. I'm going to give you a package count. 77,813 currently, as of today's date, January 13th, 2293 I have installed because I installed a couple of things. And the software from here is coming from Mint and Ubuntu. This does not contain Flatpak software. Flatpak software is only in Software Manager. So that means you've got more than 77,000 packages that can be installed. Software Manager can be found this way also. The name of this is Mint Install, and this is version 829. Very simple to use. Point and click. You can have a nice search feature. GIMP is like Photoshop very similar to it. If you see the screenshot in a foreign language, don't worry about it. As soon as you install it, if it's English, it'll install the English packs. You may have a little post-it note at the bottom there after you install it. This is available in the Linux Mint system package or Flatpak. Different screenshots actually. Flathub.org is actually a website you can visit. That's where they get this from. Self-contained. This version is 2.10.36 and that one is 2.10.30. So the other one is slightly newer. And this also has lots of, well, add-ons or whatever tools you want to call that. Anyways, um, I can go full screen on this thing too, if you like. And there's lots of categories. I mean, a whole bunch. Close that. And we are at this stage of software synaptic software sources, don't forget about time shift, and then I'll open up system settings, backgrounds, you can right click on your desktop also, effects, don't like them, turn them off, fonts, don't like the size, change them, themes, and advanced settings. The combination of this, this, and this are very Lots of different outcomes, in other words. I, I recommend screenshots when you just before you change these. You can also add more of your themes. There'll be a whole bunch of them blown in here when you do this for the first time. There's a whole bunch of themes in here. I'm sure you can find a thing or two. In here, I have a feature turned on that's normally off. Example of that would be I'll open up and let you see the scroll bar here. And then I'll turn this on and slide this to about 19. Now take a look at the size of the scroll bar. If you like these kind of things, activate this one here and put that about 19. You notice that I'm not even near the maximum and 19 is usually plenty good. Accessibility, this feature is normally off. What does that do? If I press the caps lock key or numeric, it lights up a picture. Otherwise, this is default, FYI. Mugshot, you can certainly pick stock ones too if you like. Actions is brand new for 21.3. You have lots of options in here and you can also check out the download section. It's got a whole bunch of toys. So basically, um, when we're talking um, spices, we're talking desklets, applets. Desklets are like this calendar thing. This is a non-interactive calendar. It's just meant for display. And then you have applets, which are all the toys down here. And there are quite a few. I think there are over 200. And you can also click that if you don't want to click that. Extensions, I'm using transparent panels. Example of a fully one. There's an example right there. And one with semi. And let me let you see what it is without the tool. You just get this panel bar that looks like that. Okay. General. This is your standard power button. Again, there's no timer on it. It's just waiting for you to click. If you activate this tool and you plug in the time frame you want. And now this will have a 45 second timer. 
and counting down. I don't need to do anything. I can walk away from the computer. It'll automatically shut down in 40 seconds. Or you can hit restart or force it. I want to hit cancel before that terminates. Just a couple of tips. I, I'm not going to be able to get through everything today, folks. Gestures. I believe most of them are meant for touch screens. So I'm going to turn that off because I don't have a touch screen. Hot corners I don't really use, but that just means that something will activate when I'm in the corners. You can experiment with that. Input method for different languages. Then the actual languages themselves. Language support, 23 languages are installed. Notifications. Online accounts, again, it's generally meant for this calendar, not this one. If you bring in one of those accounts. Panel bar can be edited here. Right click on the panel, it can also be edited here. It's the same dialog box. Preferred applications, if you're making changes. If you don't like the video player and you install something different, Celluloid is normally your only one, unless you install something else. Privacy. Uh, it's generally meant for the recent files. If you turn that off, it'll be missing. Won't be there. Okay. Very simple tool. Make this a little bit larger for you. The screensaver tool is just set for time for black. So if you are wondering, can I turn it off? Yes. This screensaver interacts with your power manager. These two got, kind of play together. Startup apps, I don't recommend doing anything with unless you know what you're doing. The windows, right buttons are over here, left buttons are over here, and then you have the GNOME, and they're classic. So this is default. Under, I'm gonna skip over behavior and go over to here. If you're curious about, well, actually I'll talk about this for a second. Do you see when this thing triggers, it's very sensitive? Make it less sensitive. Now it has a huge area that I can pull out. So it gives that surface area a lot wider area to trigger. You may want to try that. All right, so what does this thing do? Well, I'm going to open up something. I'll find um, calendar uh, calculator and I'll throw it down here for a second. So I will use uh, Alt and Tab to perform this action. And this is a timeline effect. And this will be cover flow. This is my favorite, actually. All I'm doing is cycling through what's open. You can actually see the recording times ticking. Okay, so I'm gonna leave it there. Then I'm gonna reverse. Window tiling, you're gonna laugh when you see this one because I'm gonna be brutal about it. So this is active. I'll open up the file manager and I'm gonna bounce it off the uh, left wall to go full. And I'm going to create another one, control N, and bounce it off the other wall. Now I got two windows open, got downloads on this side, and the file manager on this side. While I'm in here, hold down the control key, scroll back and forth if you want to resize. If not, drag that. Right click on any ISO. There's a new toy called Verify. You probably are going to laugh when you see this because I'm going to turn and do this and it'll identify what that is says Manjaro and it's calculating the SHA right now. And there's the SHA number. It's a new feature. Also, make bootable USB stick. Going back on this screen, I'm gonna pull that down and close it. And go full screen here. Resizing icons on the fly. Same feature in the previous file manager. And I rehash a lot of this stuff because I never know when I have a new viewer or a new subscriber. Spacebar, to get a preview of that, there's only one button with the X, so you don't have to use it. Spacebar to close. Spacebar to open, spacebar to close. Spacebar to open, spacebar to close. Double click, and this opens this up in a different tool. This is X Viewer. If I needed to zoom in and out, I, I hold down my Alt key and scroll back and forth. Alt key, Alt key, not control. So the control key and scrolling with my computer mouse changes the size of the thumbnails. 
when you're inside of this tool, it's the Alt key and scroll with your computer mouse. All right, just wanted to be clear on that one. You can set any of these as wallpaper. It'll be direct. So if I pull that down and right click and set it as wallpaper, it's immediate. I'll change that back. You can see how fast you can work with this stuff. You've got uh, generally a file system here, trash can is here, and home folder is here. So really you don't need any icons on your desktop. In case you do want them, right click, customize, desktop settings, and you can activate those. Okay, turn them off. These bars are meant for the icons themselves, depending on the vertical or horizontal position, you use these little drag bar to separate one or more icons. And don't forget the sizes are from Dinky to Jumbo here. Um, what else did I want to make mention of? Talked about the file manager. Again, there's more bells and whistles, but I'm just touching on the highlights. And um, I think I covered most of the settings. Actually not, I think I stopped somewhere in the tiling area. Bluetooth, if you got them, I don't really use the color calibrator. This is GNOME Disk Utility. Again, you can change your screen resolution here or here. Graphics tablet, I don't have. Keyboard shortcuts, I have lots of videos for you to watch in case you want to do that. Mouse and touchpad, that's the size of your pointer and speed and some other options, but the actual pointer is changed in here. And these are the ones that are installed. Mouse cursors or mouse pointers are only installed in two locations on all Linux systems. And you can find that one of my videos will state that. Moving back downstairs. Uh, network, I'm going to skip over. Again, power management and screensaver kind of play together. If you have printers that are auto-discovered, they'll be sitting here. If not, use the add key for USB based. I have a recent upload. If you wanted to change this to your own music on startup, that's all up to you, but this is the standard. If you don't like that, Linux Mint has some extra ones for you in here in OGA and OGG formats. My video also explains how to take regular songs and convert them into OGGs. Um, system information. My system is a little overkill, but I just wanted to point out the fact that this is 21.3, Cinnamon version 6, and I'm using a 6.2 series kernel instead of the 5.1.5. I'm also using an NVIDIA graphics card because there's NVIDIA settings. And uh, more importantly, if you do have an NVIDIA graphics card and you are using the open source drivers, normally how it boots up, you can convert that into the proprietary driver. It doesn't cost you anything. You just hit apply and when it reboots, it installs NVIDIA settings. If you need to make changes in here, by the way, normally it does not save properly. It, it has a restriction on it. You can open up terminal and type in sudo NVIDIA settings and you can change your settings there. Or you can watch my video on how to manually give yourselves the rights to save files here. So you don't have to go through terminal in the future. You may want to take a peek at that video. Software sources, I think I made mention already. What are they? Mint and Ubuntu for your Synaptic Package Manager. And in the Software Manager, it's not only Mint and Ubuntu, but it also has Flatpak software from flathub.org. You can add users in here. And I recommend if you are adding users for children, that you leave them with the standard user so they can't add and remove programs and make serious alterations to your system. There is a new feature in the login window, which I'm going to make mention of now, that is not available in 21.2. You can put your login alignment screen in the center or the right side. The default in the previous version was left and this was not here. I have mine currently set to center, you don't need to do anything. You click that and just close the box. And now it'll be, as soon as you log in, it'll be on the center of your screen. The default is normally on the left. Then you can put it in the center or the right. Okay, 
Firewall is GuffW and it comes turned off. If you decide to use Warpinator, please import some firewall rules if you activate the firewall. Otherwise, your file sharing doesn't work too well. Other than that, folks, I think I'm going to call it good. I will be doing some uh, videos in the future for this. New disk. I'm going to stop that there. Because most of the rest is just like an ad. And open this one up. Linux Mint 21.3 is just around the corner. And it's bringing several new features along with it. Let's... <clears throat> dive in and explore the enhancements that this new edition of Linux Mint has to offer. To begin, let's examine some straightforward changes that, despite their simplicity, can significantly improve the everyday user experience. Alright, let's move on to our next small improvement. Among the new fractional scaling options available in this version of Linux Mint, you'll find the addition of 75%. Let's first take a look at the display settings, where you'll notice that only 100% and 200% scaling options are available. Now, let's navigate to the settings menu and enable fractional scaling. As we can see that there are now new scaling options available. So, let's check out 75%. It works, but it's a bit too small for this video. Let's set the scaling to 150 instead so you can see better. Alright, next up window opacity key binding is back. With this, you can change the transparency of any window, making it easy to see and read what's behind it. Let's give it a try. First, we need to go to our keyboard shortcuts and look for the opacity settings. In the previous version of Mint, I tested this feature, and although it was present, it didn't work properly. You could click the button, Press the shortcut, but nothing happened. Now let's see if it's been fixed. We need to assign keys to it, so let's use something simple like Alt-Z to increase opacity and Alt-A to decrease it. Now let's test it Alt-Z. Great, it's becoming translucent. And Alt-A works in reverse. Let's see it in action on a folder. As you can see, we now have a transparent folder, making it easy to read behind it or simply use it to enhance the appearance of things. Now you can play with the opacity and turn it back to normal. How far can we go? Yeah, we can almost make the window disappear. And that's a wrap for this feature. Next, let's move on to another useful feature. The ability to disable stylus buttons. If you've got a stylus with buttons, you can now easily disable those buttons. I don't have one here, but if you do, you can make the changes here in this window. Alright, next new feature I want to share with you. When using multiple monitors, we can now pick the monitor where notifications appear. Let's go to notifications and check it out. As you can see, we can choose to send notifications to the primary monitor, the active monitor, or a specific monitor. If we select specified monitor, we can even choose the monitor number we want to use. This is especially useful for those with more than two screens. Okay, next feature is shift middle click on a sound applet. For a long time, we've had the option to middle click on the sound applet to mute it. Now, there's an additional function for shift middle click. In the sound applet options, you can customize what shift middle click does, such as choosing to mute the input, mute the output, toggle pause play, or mute. Next, let's talk about the changes in Linux Mint's built-in bulk renamer, Bulky. If you didn't know, Linux Mint has included the bulk renamer in its default setup for a few versions now. To access it, just select a few items and choose Rename. You'll see the GUI for renaming files. In this new version of Bulky, there are two notable improvements. First, you can now select items and drag and drop them into the renaming window, like this. Previously, this wasn't possible. Second, there are new thumbnails for image files in the Bulky window. Instead of the default image icon, you'll now see thumbnails, which makes it easier to see what you're renaming. Let's perform a simple rename, changing pick to img. There we go, it's now called im. That's what's new and bulky. Next, let me show you some changes in Hypnotics. Linux Mint's default IPTV watching program 
With Hypnotics, you can add a URL to a list of TV channels and watch them. Now, you can also add links to live streams and YouTube channels to watch them right inside Hypnotics. To do this first, let's change a small setting. In the settings, check the use local version of ITDLP option as the system version is outdated. To update it, simply click the button that says get the newest version from GitHub. That's it. Now, let's use Hypnotics to add name and URL for a video and its thumbnail URL. After doing this, it will appear in your favorites. I've tested it with YouTube and Twitch, and it worked with some bugs. But I'll skip the demo to keep the video nice and short. This is a good change to Hypnotics. It makes it a bit more useful. Next, let's talk about the changes in Rapinator, Linux Mint's file, sharing app for local networks. A significant new feature is the ability to connect manually, giving you more control over the connection process. To manually connect, click connect manually. You'll then have two options. Enter the IP address or take a picture of the core code to establish the connection. This feature is particularly useful when automatic connections fail, allowing you to troubleshoot and connect manually. This really makes already amazing Rapinator even better. Alright, let's dive into Cinnamon 6.0, the latest version of Linux Mint's desktop environment. It's packed with performance improvements and smaller enhancements. One cool improvement I'd like to highlight is the new take on Nemo Actions. Nemo Actions are those handy little tasks you can do in a folder's context menu. And now they're like spices that you can install from a list, just like other spices. Plus, this change allows people to create, update, and even share their own Nemo action spices. I hope the community will embrace this and we'll see lots of new options soon. For instance, check out the default Nemo actions we've got installed here. And here we have lists of actions you can download for now. This list should grow as time goes on, making Nemo actions even more awesome. Next up, we have a cool new feature on the login screen. You can now choose where you want the password box to appear. It's a nice customization option that allows you to personalize your experience. Let me show you how it works. By default, the password box is located on the left side of the screen. So, when you log out, you'll see it right there. Now, let's log back in and type in your password. For example, let's move it to the center. There you go. The login box is now centered. Of course, you can also choose to move the password box to the right side of the screen. I'm sure you can imagine how that works. So let's move on to the next thing. Another exciting feature in this version of Linux Mint is Wayland support. As you can see, you can now select to use Wayland from the login screen. However, it's important to note that Wayland is still in the early stages of development and the final version will be ready for another two years or so. Cinnamon still uses Xorg by default, which provides the best experience right now. But if you're feeling adventurous and want to try out your Wayland setup, you can do so by selecting Cinnamon on Wayland Experimental from the drop-down menu. Now, let's see if it works. We'll log in and see how it performs. Okay, let's switch our scaling back to 150%. Now, let's check out the new backgrounds while using Wayland and see if everything works smoothly. The new version of Linus Mint is named Virginia, and as always, it comes with some amazing new artwork. Linux Mint always hits the mark with the new artwork they add to each new version. Yay, most of these pictures are amazing. Can't wait to have them on my desktop. Now, let's finish our quick and easy Wayland test. Thankfully, it didn't crash, but I did notice that fractional scaling is causing some issues with the desktop background size. Nonetheless, it's just an experimental feature not meant to be ready for another two years or more, so it's all good. Most of the changes in this version are happening behind the scenes and on the system level, fixing bugs and improving the overall experience. However, I wanted to show you the things that are important to the user like the new features that will change how you use Linux Mint. Overall, I think it's still a pretty good update. Thank you for watching and have fun tinkering. Hey guy. At least he didn't do uh, the usual ads.
so. Linux Mint 21.3 was released last week, and while you should not expect a ton of visual or functional enhancements, it does come with one pretty major feature, a Wayland session. Obviously, it is still experimental, but it's complete enough that I could give it a fair shake, on top of looking at everything else that Mint 21.3 brings to the table. So here is a little walkthrough of all the changes to this very popular distro. And here is also another walkthrough to this segue to our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Thunderbird. Most of you probably know about it, but for those who don't, it's an all-in-one Windows and Mac OS. So whether you used Thunderbird in the past or not, click the link in the description below and give the new release a try. You will not regret it. So let's begin in with the basics. Min 21.3 is still based on Ubuntu 22.04. Their next release will be based on 24.04, but for now you still have that old Ubuntu LTS base, its old packages, and its super old kernel, version 5.15. You do get the Mesa drivers version 23, but not the latest point update. And you don't get the latest NVIDIA drivers either, you're still on 535. Now Mint does have a newer ISO plan called the Edge ISO, which will pack in a newer Linux kernel at least, so you can run Mint on newer hardware. But the base version is still pretty damn old. Apart from that, you're getting Cinnamon 6, the latest update to the default desktop environment, and you can also get the usual Mate and XFCE variants, although these didn't get any updates to their desktop environments, you're just getting the app updates here. And so with that out of the way, let's take a look at the new experimental Wayland session for Cinnamon, because that's the main event here. So you can select that Wayland session from the login screen, like you would select another desktop environment to start. I tested this on a spare laptop that uses an Intel XE integrated GPU and also has a dedicated NVIDIA GPU, and I tried the Wayland session using both cards. So at first glance, everything seems to work okay. Windows are displayed correctly, the display resolution is set how it should be, you don't get any screen tearing that I could see at least, and the Cinnamon desktop responds normally with its right-click menus, minimizing, maximizing, edge styling, and the like. The performance also felt completely normal, it even detected the 90Hz refresh rate of my display. Video playback in Firefox and other applications worked, with picture-in-picture -picture as well. All the audio plumbing worked as well, multi-monitor support seemed okay, with both displays being recognized, and things moving normally from one display to the other. But it is an experimental session, so not everything is finished just yet. You didn't expect everything to be okay, right? It's Linux we're talking about. And yeah, a lot of things are still missing. OBS, for example, doesn't even start using the dev package. The flat pack works, but has no source for the display. Cinnamon doesn't seem to support the screen sharing protocol through Pipewire, so OBS has nothing to display here. So that's the first main thing. You will not be sharing your screen to anyone just yet, not even in web browser based stuff like Jitsi. And no screen recorder I tried could capture anything either here, neither simple screen recorder, nothing works with that experimental Wayland session, so these captures are mainly from a VM. Another issue I encountered is the lack of any pseudo graphical prompt. Anytime I needed to install a package or update the system, I had to use the command line, as the graphical app would not spawn a graphical password prompt, and the task would just fail. I also got some inconsistencies in the place where menus appeared. For example, when right-clicking certain notification tray icons, their menus displayed in the wrong place. Some applets displayed their menu just fine, but others didn't and opened like a window, following the window placement that I defined. This basic window positioning setting worked fine though, I could set windows to open centered, as everyone should, and it worked perfectly there. And some applications behaved erratically. The main one is Steam. It either got stuck on the login screen, or it displayed a fully black window with nothing in there, and generally it was unable to quit. That was with the dev package. 
the flat pack ran normally. Sometimes, but not always, taking very long to display my library window. But it did allow me to try out a game and see how it performed, so keep watching to know how this went. There were also a few things that I couldn't find, like changing the keyboard layout in the Wayland session. It doesn't seem possible. The layouts tab doesn't appear in the settings where it should be. The gestures of Cinnamon also don't work here for now. You can enable them, but they will not do anything. And you know, I love my gestures and Wayland is the best place to have gestures. So hopefully they will implement them in a suitable way, like one-to-one -one gestures where stuff moves as you move your fingers. But for now, it's not there. The hot corners did work though with their nice animations and features. But there were some weird graphical things happening. For example, when trying to display all windows, the windows moved in position, they spread across the screen, but you could still see them in the background, as if Cinnamon had taken a screenshot of the display before moving the windows into expose mode. Some settings pages also seemed to have some sort of infinite scroll and didn't stop at their own content, which was a bit weird. But X Wayland seemed to work okay here, since I could actually open a Steam window and a game using the flatpack. Dragging icons from the desktop also doesn't seem to work properly as the icon gets stuck a few pixels from the initial drag point and it doesn't move with the cursor, although the dragging operation can still succeed. So all in all, it's really not bad, but it is living up to its name. It is an experimental session. And that was all using the Intel integrated GPU. I did try it with the Nvidia GPU as well. So by default, Mint uses the Nuvo drivers, which obviously will not work all that well with the RTX 3050 Ti I have on that laptop. So I installed the proprietary drivers for that card at the version Mint offers, which is 535, so not the latest with all the Wayland fixes. And then I rebooted. After that, I tried the Wayland session and all the problems I experienced previously we're still there, obviously, they are all missing features in the experimental session, so there's no reason to expect them to work better on NVIDIA. But I also didn't get any other issue that I hadn't seen in the Wayland session with the Mesa drivers. It just works exactly the same with NVIDIA or Intel. And before you start commenting furiously that Wayland plus NVIDIA doesn't work, yes, yes, it absolutely does. I've been using Fedora and then Tuxedo OS on hybrid graphics laptops with dedicated NVIDIA GPUs on hybrid mode. I've been using full NVIDIA on the desktop and I never encountered any major problems. So yes, it does work, mostly because I had recent GPUs, but it does work. Now, just as a little experiment, I also decided to run a game in the Wayland session, namely Warhammer 40k Mechanicus, because, well, I have started a Mechanicus army for the real tabletop game of 40k, and I just got my butt kicked by a Necron playing friend this weekend. So, well, I like 40k and I like the tech priest, so sue me, I'm playing that game. And yeah, if you didn't understand a single word I just said, don't worry, it's not super relevant to this video. So playing that game on the Wayland session actually worked well without the proprietary NVIDIA drivers installed. I could only manage 25 to 32 FPS in-game, which is normal as even though that game isn't super demanding, it is still too much for the poor XE graphics. Playing the same game on X11 with the same drivers and the same settings, I got 32 to 37 FPS, which is more stable and a little bit better. With the proprietary NVIDIA drivers installed and running the game using the dedicated GPU, I got 65 to 75 FPS on X11 and 60 to 65 on Wayland, which is again in favor of X11, not surprising since the game is played using X Wayland and this has a performance penalty. So of course it is not super representative, it's just one game, but it does prove that X Wayland works on that experimental session, that Proton works, and that accelerated GPU rendering also works, which is not bad for a first run of a session. Okay, so now let's talk about the other changes in Linux Mint 21.3, because Wayland isn't all that has been added. In terms of app updates, Hypnotics, the TV watching app, now lets you set channels as favorites, and you can access all these favorites using the star icon on the home screen. You can also create your own custom TV channels if you want, by just adding a URL for a video stream and setting a name and icon, and you'll be able to access it at any time from the app. 
Hypnotics will also now let you update the version of YouTube downloader that it uses to stream YouTube channels because the package in the repos just is not updated often enough to catch up with the changes YouTube makes. Cinnamon will also let you download actions. These are add-ons for the file manager that will appear in the right-click context menu, letting you do, well, custom actions like verifying an ISO file, creating a bootable USB drive, and more. So in the actions window, which you can find in the main menu, you will now be able to download new context menu entries and to add them to Nemo, the file manager. Warpinator, the file sharing app, now lets you connect to a device manually by just entering its IP address or scanning a QR code. The Sticky Notes app can now be managed by Dbus, meaning you can manage your notes using scripts. And the bulk rename tool of Mint now supports drag and drop and thumbnails. So pretty small changes all around. It's not going to change how you use your system or your distro. It's really minor updates. As per the desktop itself, you can now use 75% fractional scaling on X11 if you want that. You can also set keybinds to change the window opacity again. You can disable stylus buttons if you use that sort of hardware. And gestures got a bit better with the ability to set a gesture to zoom in on the desktop. Again, small changes, it will not change how you use your system. So if you already use Mint to upgrade to 21.3, all you have to do is launch the update manager, click the refresh button so you can get an update to the update manager itself, and then click on the edit menu and then upgrade to Linux Mint 21.3 Virginia. And that's it, you're done. After the download, install and reboot, you'll be using the latest Mint version. So obviously 21.3 is a minor version and Mint has a habit of shipping big features in minor updates and this is the case because a full-on Wayland session, even experimental, is a pretty giant feature and it's honestly not that bad. It is pretty cool to see that their first iteration of that session is already pretty damn complete. Apart from screen sharing and a few bugs here and there and a few missing features, it's already working well. Mint expects Wayland to be fully baked in in 2026 and it won't be the default for the next major version, Mint 22. I would expect the Debian-based version of Mint to also support Wayland with the same capabilities. And so it's good to see that Mint, despite taking their sweet time to get started on working on that Wayland session, has done the brunt of the work in relatively little time. And also it means that Mint is now way more future-proof because at some point Ubuntu and Debian will drop X11 from their repos. So the sooner you have a fully working Wayland session, the better you are prepared for that future that will come. Two years, five years, ten years, but it's coming. And if you don't care about Wayland at all, 21.3 is still a worthy update for any Mint user. And if you tried Linux Mint and it didn't quite work on your recent hardware, well, you can wait for the Edge ISO to drop to get a better Linux kernel and make sure that you can run that great experience that Mint has on your new Linux computer. And speaking of new Linux computers, well, let's talk about our sponsor. Tuxedo Computers is based in Germany, but they ship to most countries in the world. And what they ship... I'm going to pause it and stop. Okay, I'm going to pause here for a second. Uh, does anybody have any uh, questions or comments that I might be able to uh, uh, field? I, with LMDE, is there an option to use Wayland yet? No, and not that I've seen. Uh, now, mind you, I haven't gone through all the uh, uh, purposes, uh, uh, things through here. But I do have uh, uh, LMDE in here on a video. Yeah. Uh, hang on for one second. I am going to try and shoot myself in the foot like normal. And somewhere in here. I didn't think it was likely because I, Damon does tend to be pretty conservative about these things. And Debian, mainstream Debian, is uh, probably about two or three years away from using Wayland. I'm going to stop the share for a second. Come on. All right. Got that. Now. Uh, 
don't want to go to. We're all big again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big deal. All right. There's chat. And I reminds me of Alice in Wonderland, so I was wondering what I ate. <laughs> Huh. You got to do it a different way on here. So, sorry about this. And there we go. Okay. I just put in chat a document of these uh, uh, videos and their links. And I'm going to reshare. And I'm going to move on to, I hope, here we go. Now, I'm pausing this for turn it. I hate it. So, a few weeks ago, what the heck? Oh, I'm going to shoot these people. Uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, Oh, boy. I think I just lost one of my videos. And... No, I, I did uh, lose one of them. Hang loose for a minute. I want to shoot them. Uh, 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 they keep uh, popping things all over... God's a little green earth, and you can't do squat without losing stuff. Oh, I don't want to know. Um, here it is. And get lost. Get lost. New tab, paste it in. And oh, rats. Nothing wants to work my way. Okay. Now stop and stay stopped. Now I want to point out something. Uh, uh, this person really talks fast. And the previous one talked kind of fast, but it wasn't too bad, at least not to me. But if you need to, go to the gear here, and you have playback speed. And I can set this to 75% normal. And then I'm going to enlarge that. Start it. Greetings and welcome to another minty episode of Veronica Explains. I'm Veronica, and today I'd like to chat about two different versions of Linux Mint. The flagship Ubuntu-based edition and the alternative Debian-based edition or as the cool kids say, LMDE. I've been using both versions off and on for the last couple of months, and that's given me some recent perspective on the Linux Mint ecosystem. And I think I'm ready to chat about these two choices. Now, before I get into the specifics, please note that I'm recording this at the end of 2023. If you're watching this in the not-too-distant future, the information here might not be the most up-to-date. I'll be doing some head-to-head -head comparisons in a moment, and those will certainly be out of date in the near future. That said, I'm going to try to cover this from more of a long-term user perspective. And full disclosure, this video isn't sponsored by anyone at all, including anyone at the Mint team. 
Like most of my videos, the only folks funding today's escapades are my supporters. Thanks, by the way. With that out of the way, here's a recap of the different versions. The traditional Linux Mint experience is based on Ubuntu. Ubuntu 22.04 LTS as of the time I'm making this video. But unlike Ubuntu, Linux Mint ships with the Snap Store disabled, providing support for Flatpak instead, as well as traditional application packages. In contrast, the Linux Mint Debian edition is, unsurprisingly, based on Debian. Debian 12 as of recording. Like the flagship version, LMDE ships with the Snap Store disabled. So, if you want something in the apt family of distros, but want to avoid snaps, the Linux Mint family deserves to be on your radar. If you care about Wayland versus X11 as a windowing system, Linux Mint is running X11, but has some plans to start Wayland experiments in the very near future. It'll likely be a while before it's fully supported, though. The look and feel of both flagship Mint as well as LMDE is provided by the Cinnamon Desktop environment, a desktop born from an early chapter in the storybook of distro separating themselves from GNOME due to disagreements. In this case, over a decade ago, the Mint team forked GNOME 3 components into a desktop that's perhaps a bit more familiar to folks coming from certain alternative operating systems. Granted, it's not as flexible as a tiling window manager or KDE Plasma, but maybe for you, that's fine. Mint has always been on my short list of distributions to recommend, and for good reason. It's a pretty great experience, both on the surface as well as under the hood. In fact, I used Mint every day for about a year or so on my COBOL development desktop. That was about four to five years ago, mind you, but it was a great, stable experience. Nowadays, I'm a tiling and stacking person, so Mint's quote traditional desktop metaphor end quote, whatever that means in the roaring 2K20s, isn't exactly my cup of tea. But you might feel different, and that's okay. Besides, unlike Windows 11, which is pretty rigid in where you're allowed to put things, Mint is customizable to a degree where almost anyone could create a layout which they'd love. Anyway, the Linux Mint team says they started the Debian edition to ensure Linux Mint can continue to deliver the same user experience if Ubuntu was ever to disappear. Now, is that likely? Probably not. But as a project, I think it's a great thing to be prepared to rebase should it become advantageous to do so. Ubuntu's ever-increasing focus on Snap packages has certainly alienated a lot of Linux users. And while I'm not going to litigate that here, I certainly think it makes sense for the Mint team to consider Ubuntu's current standing among the community, for better or worse, when making their plans. Plus, one neat thing about the Debian edition is that there's a 32-bit ISO available, which is great for older hardware. Anyway, if you want me to cover more about the Mint project itself in a future video, make sure to let me know in the comments. 
Maybe I'll try installing Linux Mint on one of my really old laptops I have lying around. Not old by any means. The laptop I made use of for my months of minty madness was this modest Dell Latitude 5490 from 2019. This is certainly no gaming laptop, which you'll see in a minute. For my testing, I swap back and forth between two identical NVMe drives, one with the Ubuntu version and the other one with the Debian version. Then, I just use both of them for a few weeks, bopping back and forth and testing things out. And side note to laptop manufacturers, now that drive media is this small, why can't we have ejectable NVMe slots on laptops just for nerds like me who swap OSs frequently? Anyway, installing each of them was straightforward. They do appear to use different installers, though, probably owing to some type of upstream difference or something. I did some research trying to figure this out, and I wasn't able to figure out why they use different installers. So if you happen to know, make sure to leave me a comment. The Ubuntu version prompts you to install multimedia codecs while you install, whereas the Debian version gives you a prompt after installation. But personally, I think that's a pretty minor difference. As of a few weeks ago when I captured this footage, the Ubuntu version was on kernel 5.15, whereas the Debian version was on kernel 6.1. This makes sense given where we are in the release cycle, as Debian 12 is more recent than Ubuntu 22.04. This also means that at the moment, it isn't just the kernel that's picking up on the more up-to-date packages from Debian 12. Lutris and Steam are both a bit ahead, as are some of your favorite programming languages. Package newness is hardly a gotcha for the Debian edition, though. In a few months, Ubuntu 24.04 will be released, and downstream distros like Linux Mint will eventually pick up those changes in new releases. Even now, at the time I'm recording this talking head, Linux Mint 21.3 is in beta. It might even be released by the time you're watching this video. So, barring some radical change, in the reasonably near future, newer versions of Linux Mint's Ubuntu edition will almost certainly have many newer packages when compared against the Debian edition. But after that, Debian will release a whole new version upstream, and this entire process starts anew. So again, the package differences alone aren't going to tell you the whole story. Now, as far as Mint's very popular Cinnamon desktop environment, both were rocking 5.8.4 during my weeks of testing Mint. You might be interested to know that pure upstream Debian also packages Cinnamon, but the current version appears to be a couple of points behind. This also gets to a broader point. Calling LMDE a Debian clone isn't exactly accurate. The Cinnamon desktop environment is a Linux Mint project, so getting it directly from the Mint team absolutely makes sense. If Cinnamon is your jam, Using Linux Mint is probably the best way to get it. Particularly since the Mint team will be getting Cinnamon 6 out as we speak. It could take a while for some other distributions to get it. Anyway, this laptop might not be capable of gaming all that much, but that didn't stop me from trying. 
I was able to get StarCraft Remastered installed via Lutris and it played great on both versions of Linux Mint. But that's not terribly surprising. On the Steam side, I had great luck getting one of my favorite games loaded, Poulet Poulet, which played great on both Ubuntu and Debian versions. I did try ChexQuest, which was frankly awful on both systems, but it was equally as awful on each system. As was Sonic via Sega Super Collection on Steam, or whatever they call it. Sonic did play great via RetroArch on Lutris, though. And don't worry, I dumped this ROM myself. Oh, want to know how? Well, I'll show you in a future video. This is far from an exhaustive comparison between the two versions, and that's okay. The direct comparison is really only a small part of the consideration here. Now, to get my bias out there, I'm a Debian user, having switched earlier this year from Pop! OS. I've been using Linux since about 2005, bopping between distros across the spectrum, Debian-based, Arch-based, RPM-based. I've used them all in a variety of applications, both personally and professionally. I currently run Debian SID on my editing desktop, but Debian Stable on most of my production servers as well as my everyday working laptop. You might think I'm predisposed to saying that I think the Debian edition of Linux Mint is a great choice. And you'd be right! If you last tried a Debian-based distro some years ago and were put off by driver issues, I gotta say it's worth trying the ecosystem again. A lot has changed with Debian 12. Most folks I know don't want to spend night after night configuring their desktop. They want to start their computer and just do computer stuff. Since Debian 12 was released and the non-free repos became more tightly integrated, the Debian experience has been exceptionally smooth for me on the desktop. LMDE 6 is the same great experience. It just works. From upstream, it gains the advantages of the non-free and firmware repos being available, and that means a lot of the problems running Debian on the desktop just aren't there anymore. If you want a no-nonsense computing platform, I think it's a great choice, particularly if you enjoy the defaults provided by Linux Mint. I mean, if you're going to be skinning your Debian to look more like Mint anyway, why not just start with LMDE and be done with it? You get the benefits of Mint's up-to-date cinnamon without having to update your configuration all that much. Now, if you want the benefits of a more frequent release cycle but want to stick with Mint, you have two perfectly reasonable choices. One would be the Linux Mint Ubuntu edition, which is still a great choice for folks dipping their toe in the Linux waters. You can also use backports and LMDE to start to build whatever system you want. Backports, of course, could be a future video on their own. Shoot me a comment if that's something you want to see. All that said, if you want a cutting-edge system or you're using cutting-edge hardware, Linux Mint may not be the choice for you, Debian or otherwise. But come on, you knew that already. Linux Mint isn't the choice I'd recommend if you update your GPU every single year. That isn't me by any stretch of the imagination, and my experiences are certainly going to reflect that. 
Linux Mint's Ubuntu edition is a somewhat happy medium between the two-year cycle of Linux Mint Debian edition and a rolling release like Tumbleweed or Arch. Releasing point releases every six months gets you a few more frequent updates if that's your thing. That said, those point releases are still based off of the Ubuntu LTS releases, which means they're skipping the semi-annual Ubuntu releases for a two-year cycle overall, which for me begs a question. Why relegate the Debian edition to an alternative in the first place? I mean, don't get me wrong, it's not like I'm arguing against continuing the Ubuntu-based version. I'm sure there are specific uses where it's a better fit. Even if I don't see a need to use the Ubuntu-specific repos myself personally. And as long as desnapifying Ubuntu isn't too much work for the Linux Mint team, I see no reason why they shouldn't keep offering the Ubuntu-based distro. I guess I just think that LMDE6 is so good that it deserves equal billing with the Ubuntu edition. I mean, if there's some reason LMDE deserves to be an alternative and not an equal choice, I don't think they've articulated it. One obvious reason to consider the Debian edition as on par with the Ubuntu edition is Flatpak. If you don't know, Flatpak is a method of deploying apps that's really making inroads with a lot of developers, allowing sandboxed versions of apps to ship needed dependencies independent of the underlying release cycle. Basically, from an end-user perspective, nowadays you can get more recent versions of apps with a light to modest trade-off in efficiency. It's far from perfect, but it's much better than it was as a Linux user in the 2000s. On Mint, Flatpak and its central repository FlatHub is incredibly well integrated into both Ubuntu Mint and LMDE, and provides even more frequent software updates. Even at the expense of a little extra room on your computer, it really makes the distinction between basing your distro on Debian versus Ubuntu a lot less pronounced than it used to be. Debian is really an awesome base for folks who want a computer to just work, and I like not having to update every day. It means fewer breaking changes and a lot more time to spend on getting work done. It's not that Ubuntu can't be that thing, but it does update more frequently. It's definitely something to keep in mind when choosing a distro. Now, I'd be curious to see Mint's take on Mate and XFCE paired with Debian as well, although I have to admit I'm not totally sure what that would accomplish over vanilla Debian right now. Maybe you know, and I'm sure you're about to leave a comment. What other distros do you want me to compare? Make sure to let me know, because I'd love to do more videos like this. Maybe I should compare Linux Mint Debian Edition with a bog-standard Debian in a future video. One of the things I love about Linux is how we can fork, branch, and build fantastic new tools like Linux Mint out of many other sources, and then share those end results with the world at large. That's because Linux is awesome. And so are you. It's time once again for... Okay, I'm lost. Okay, I'm stopping that one here. Uh, if you really...
if you really want to uh, uh, get a, a a fun time, play this uh, uh, one video again at uh, normal speed and see how fast she really talks. Uh, one comment about XFCE versus Cinnamon. Uh, the advantage, of course, being XFCE is well known to be very light on resource usage. My converted Chromebook runs XFCE. Yes, I, I Otherwise, I see very little practical reason why you couldn't do either. Uh, the XFCE I use on a few of my ancient low-end uh, uh, either Chromebooks or uh, Windows uh, uh, laptops. I've got two cats here that are driving me nuts. <sighs> this is the all new LMDE6 and it's trending right now. LMD is short for Linux Mint Debian Edition and it's an extraordinary distro from the makers of the wildly popular Linux Mint. What started off as a backup project has grown into a fantastic operating system, merging the best of both worlds, Debian's time-tested stability and Linux Mint's fresh modern approach. I was left surprised by the high quality computing experience that this distro provides. Really, LMD is carving its own place in the Linux world and it's definitely here to stay. I've been playing with LMD6 for some time now to see how it performs as my main system. I was really anticipated to see how LMD6 compares against other top distros, especially my main Linux Mint system, and LMD came out with flying colors. Really, in certain areas, this is even better than the main Linux Mint, and very honestly, LMD6 is a strong contender for the throne of the best Linux distro of 2023. So I'm thrilled to bring LMD6 to you today. Let's jump right in and have a look at the user interface, the performance, the stability, software availability, gaming, and finally see why this stealthy distro is getting hyped to the kingdom come. Having a good knowledge of Linux commands and being comfortable using the terminal really broadens what you can do with Linux and what kind of experience you are going to get here. So if you're interested in leveling up your Linux game, definitely check out my course Linux Mastery Express, which is the fastest way to learn Linux and start using Linux like a pro. I'll teach you a set of commands that will give you the confidence to use Linux without even a graphical user interface. Then we'll dive deep and learn how to use the V editor and master shell scripting with real life examples. After teaching more than 100 students in person, I've curated this course with the top things that will level up your Linux skills the fastest. So if you're feeling like your Linux game is stuck in the same spot for too long and you're ready to take your Linux skills to the next level quickly, check out the link in the description below and get your Linux Mastery Express. We are running a massive 45% discount right now, so make use of it. Before we start off, it's important that we understand what exactly LMD is. LMD or Linux Mint Debian Edition, as the name suggests, is Linux Mint, but it's based on Debian instead of Ubuntu. LMD was initiated as a backup project for the main Linux Mint, just in case Ubuntu died or went haywire and changed too much to be a viable base for Linux Mint. LMD aims to combine the strength and stability of Debian with the elegance and modern user experience that Cinnamon Desktop provides. In this process, LMD has become more than the sum of both its components. In a world of four snaps and hefty flat packs, rapidly changing technology that's too fast for users to catch on, LMD is becoming a solid lighthouse, providing the perfect equilibrium, unchanging reliability and a contemporary computing experience. And because of these undeniable reasons, LMD is catching traction in the Linux community and accumulating itself a strong and growing user base. LMD6 features the latest Cinnamon desktop environment. Now Cinnamon desktop has a hardcore fan following because of its elegance and the way of doing things. I wouldn't be wrong in saying that Cinnamon desktop catapulted Linux Mint to its success. Yeah, Cinnamon is one single biggest reason for Linux Mint's popularity. We get the exact same Cinnamon desktop here. Cinnamon Desktop has a traditional layout and it's one of the simplest ways to use your computer. The menu on the bottom left has all your applications and a fast search to help you open apps and files quickly. Then you have your favorites and running apps here. Lastly, you have your tray items, quick controls like volume and the calendar. Yeah, this desktop is familiar to everybody. That's what makes using Cinnamon so much simpler. 
There's pretty much no learning curve involved here. You can just jump in and start using this system. And talking about the looks, Cinnamon desktop looks very elegant. There is a high level of polish here and all the elements like the menu, the tray icons and the windows look very good. The theming here makes all the applications look very gorgeous and uniform. Mint developers have been playing with the theme and this version of Cinnamon has received polishing touches to improve the look, especially the title bar of window controls. Cinnamon desktop has taken a very balanced approach throughout. While the looks, the elements have been updated throughout time to be modern always, how you interact with your computer, how you use your computer has stayed consistent. So whenever there's an update, you never have to relearn how to do something on the Cinnamon desktop. Cinnamon Desktop offers a decent amount of customization options. You can tweak the colors, change animations and play with a few other things. But the customization options don't overwhelm you like they do on KD Plasma. Everything is kept simple. Cinnamon Desktop is an UI unlike anything. It's one of the best in the business. I use Linux Mint as my main system and the Cinnamon Desktop played a big role in that decision. We get the same Cinnamon Desktop here on LMD. And it's not just Cinnamon. The full app suite of Linux Mint like the Mint Software Manager, Media Players, Utilities and all the Mint stuff is present here. LMD gives you a modern and elegant user experience. With Debian, you'll be getting slightly older desktops, but LMD solves that issue. As far as looks are concerned, LMD is full Linux Mint. In fact, you can't even tell the difference between Mint and LMD just by looking at the desktop. And the differences lay deeper than the UI, but in the UI department. LMD scores top points as you are getting the impeccable Cinnamon desktop here in all its glory. The main Linux Mint is based on Ubuntu LTS versions. Linux Mint Debian edition obviously is based on Debian. While Ubuntu itself is based on Debian, it is based on Debian SID, which is kind of an unstable branch. LMD is based on the latest stable branch of Debian. This leads to considerable differences in the user experience. And another thing is, Ubuntu adds many things to create its own unique identity. For example, snaps and a customized desktop environment. Linux Mint, on the other hand, aims to deliver a pure experience. We'll define pure in a moment, but yeah, Ubuntu has taken a road that takes it away from Mint's philosophy. Talking about the stability itself, Ubuntu, the main Linux Mint's base, is very stable. It's very reliable and it is the most popular Linux distro in the world. No question about that. But it is derived from Debian and then Mint uses that as the base. With LMD, Mint cuts out the middleman and directly bases on Debian Stable. Now Debian Stable is the most stable, dependable operating system there is. It's also one of the oldest and influential operating systems. It undergoes extensive testing and prioritizes stability over everything. It's the ROC OS. The desktop Linux scene is ever evolving. I mean, people come here for that cutting edge experience. With cutting edge comes constant change. GNOME 2 to GNOME 3, GNOME 3 to GNOME 40, things change. With every change, the user needs to readjust and relearn how to do things. This can be cumbersome for some people. I mean, when I'm in the middle of important projects, I really don't have the time or the energy to deal with abrupt changes in how my computer works. Debian stands as an unwavering beacon of consistency. In this fast-moving technical landscape, Debian provides a computing platform that's consistent. Debian has a slow moment. Yeah, at times, it does feel outdated. I won't even deny that but it doesn't compromise on its philosophies, that is providing a coherent and reliable system always. While most other distros are flirting with the bleeding edge tech, trying out new things for the sake of being advanced, Debian doesn't even play that game. This results in Debian's stable versions being impeccable. Everything works absolutely flawlessly thanks to long and rigorous testing. LMD is based on this very Debian stable. It just comes in a different wrapper, a shinier gift wrapping. This strong stability has become LMD's biggest selling point. But there's more here. The software seen on LMD is the absolute trump card here. See, the newer unified package managers like Snap and Flatpak are amazing. They bring the newest versions of all the software, they are self-updating and never have any dependency issues. I use a few of these apps, but most of my apps are still installed as full native packages. There is a beauty to native package managers like apt and rpm. They install software so harmoniously and Debian's apt package manager stands in a very special place. It's one of the best in the business. Also, software installed using these full native package managers take up way, way less storage space compared to snaps or flat packs. These are so much faster to start up and can be lighter on the system as well. And many people do prefer to use full native packages. Ubuntu, while it still provides a rich software repository, is nevertheless encouraging and even pushing snaps onto its users. Once there is heavy acceptance of snaps, 
it's reasonable to think that attention to its .dev software repositories might start being downshifted. I mean, why would they waste resources on something that very less people use? Although, I should stress that this hasn't happened yet. Most distros like Ubuntu and Fedora are fully supporting their native packages, but full-fledged promotion of snaps and flatpacks is evident. Debian, on the other hand, is fully committed to testing and maintaining its own software packages in full native format. While you can install both snaps and flatpacks here, Debian's commitment to its package repositories remains unchanged. The newest Debian stable, that is Debian 12, which LMD6 is based upon, contains 64,000 well-tested packages. This means you can install anything you want directly from Debian repositories here. Daily tools, office utilities, browsers, games, programming tools, yeah, anything and everything you want will be available here in .deb format. And I'm expecting this to remain the same for a long time. Even if native packages here downgrade on other distros, Debian is going to remain the last resort for people like me who prefer to use full native packages. LMD6 comes with Mint Software Manager which is one of the best software managers out there. It's extremely simple. It provides a good set of software nicely organized into categories. You can install software here in both .dev formats as well as flat packs. You can use the drop down here to select the packaging format that you want. Overall, the software situation on LMD, thanks to its Debian base, creates a very unique place for LMD. I think we can use the word pure to describe the software availability on LMD. Since most other distros are going the unified package manager route, LMD becomes even more valuable. Top points here. LMD shines in the performance section thanks to the use of optimized components. Firstly, LMD's Cinnamon desktop is very efficient when you're talking about modern desktop environments. Cinnamon, compared to something like GNOME, uses less resources, resulting in a responsive experience. App opening, switching between apps, it's all very fluid here. While Cinnamon Desktop does use animations and effects, they are nonetheless kept minimal, and the desktop doesn't incorporate huge effects like GNOME's Activities Overview. All the desktop actions like opening the menu have a minimal impact, and the base of the system delivers a very balanced performance. Debian is known to have a very balanced performance profile. It delivers a reliable and fluid performance across a range of hardware. LMD performs slightly faster when compared to the main Linux Mint as well. Now Linux Mint itself delivers phenomenal performance. LMD outshines that by a slight margin. It may be because of different versions of packages used in Debian or even the kernel. Ubuntu tweaks the mainline kernel with its own performance and stability tweaks while Debian keeps it more stock. LMD feels nimbler than Mint. Another thing is, Debian has extensive hardware support. Debian works out of the box on a wide range of hardware. Debian is known for that it just works feature. LMD benefits hugely from this. It too works out of the box on most hardware. You won't need to get under the hood to install drivers, do it configuration files and stuff. Everything works optimally here. LMD6 provides the perfect system for gaming. For gaming, I always prefer slow moving distros because they generally don't break your games with changing components. I use a separate dedicated distro for gaming and it's not the same as my main work system. And when I log into my gaming system, I just want to game and not do anything else like dealing with updates or any kind of housekeeping. So you can see how LMD fits in perfectly here. On LMD, Steam is going to be a gaming essential. Actually, on any distro, Steam has become a must-have if you want to explore the gaming potentials here. Steam has a vast library of Linux titles, Counter-Strike, the Tomb Raider series, Dota 2, Team Fortress 2, and many more fun titles are available natively on Linux here. But the real genius kicks in once you enable Steam Play from the Steam settings. With Steam Play enabled, you can play thousands of Windows exclusive titles on Linux like they are Linux native. There is no installation or configuration hassle. Steam will install Windows games with Proton compatibility layer and configure everything automatically. This works surprisingly well. You can play AAA titles like GTA 5, The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, Cyberpunk 2077 and many more on Linux like they are Linux native. Really, Steam has revolutionized gaming on Linux. Apart from this, you can get hundreds of absolutely free games directly from the software store here. The gaming section in the software manager is steaming with fun titles that can be so much fun. Check out Zero AD, Xonautic, Hedge Wars, Super Tux Cart and a lot more here. All in all, gaming on LMD6 is super fun and very convenient. And if you use Steam, gaming becomes unstoppable here. Installing and getting started with LMD6 is very straightforward. Once you download the ISO file from the official website, which is linked in the description below, you flash it onto a USB stick and live boot into it. Then start the installer. 
The installer is very similar to what Ubuntu has or even the main Linux Mint has. Everything is easy to understand and represented in very beginner friendly way here. Once you configure all the options like your language, time zone and partition to install LMD, the system will be installed in 15 minutes. Talking about the drivers, LMD contains almost all the hardware drivers. GPU drivers for Intel Integrated and AMD are pre-installed. If you have NVIDIA hardware, you'll need to manually install proprietary drivers. It's easy peasy. Just follow the link given in the description below. Overall, installing and getting started with LMD is a breeze. LMD has a growing community. Many people are embracing LMD and the number of people using it is growing steadily. Many people are even choosing LMD over the main mint. The Linux Mint forums are growing with LMD related how-tos, troubleshooting guides and answers to questions. Since LMD is Debian under the hood, you can safely apply guides written for Debian 12 to LMD 6. Of course, not stuff related to the desktop environment. But things like how to install something, drivers, under the hood tweaking and most of the help material written for Debian can be used with LMD. And Debian has extensive availability of such guides. Pretty much any question you might have, you'll find them already answered for Debian. Basing on a long-standing and popular Linux distro has very impactful advantages in this department and LMD sure gets these. The combined community support of LMD and Debian ensures that you never get stuck with any issues on the new LMD. Any issue, first search how to solve it on LMD and if you don't find a satisfactory solution, then search how to solve the issue on Debian 12. You'll get it. Linux Mint developers are magicians, honestly. What they did with Linux Mint is absolutely commendable. How many people can say that they'll improve upon Ubuntu which itself is a top quality product and the world's most used Linux distro? Not many. I mean a few can say that like Zoe OS developers and Elementary OS developers but not many. You get the idea. But Mint is a smash hit because it does improve upon the Ubuntu experience. Millions of people use Mint and it's a loud system. Now they have done the same with Debian. Debian is a phenomenal system. For most people, Flawless stability is going to be more important than bleeding edge software. Debian understands this and delivers on it. With LMD, Mint developers wrap up this super solid system in a shinier package and make it more attractive. And this is Debian made vastly simpler. LMD is easier than Debian to install and get started with. It's simpler to use and configure thanks to Cinnamon Desktop and the overall experience of using this system is a very palpable one. You can download the latest LMD using the link given in the description below. Alright, if you enjoyed this deep dive with LMD6, definitely consider subscribing to the channel and leave me a big thumbs up. And if you're interested in leveling up your Linux skills, the link to my course Linux Mastery X. Okay, I'm stopping that one here. Fortunately, my cats uh, uh, calmed down a, a bit. I'm looking at uh, time here. Okay. Now, uh, in addition, I have a uh, article here. Well, a video. Uh, Linux graphic drivers explain AMD, Nvidia, Intel, open source, and proprietary. I have uh, uh, big things uh, uh, coming to uh, 2024 uh, version, but don't expect uh, uh, too much. I have one here that's on Whalen, uh, breaks everything. FOSS licenses aren't enough. More AI regulation. And open uh, uh, Linux and uh, open source news. This one has some interesting little tidbits in it. So I suggest going over that. Uh, 10 reasons why Linux Mint is a desktop OS to be. Uh, in 2023, well, I think it's going to get better in 2024, especially with the LMDE6. And then um, here's some uh, uh, additional uh, Linux Mint uh, tips and tricks. I'll let you guys go through those because I want to uh, reduce that. And I want to bring up the software manager. Now, it isn't very often, but uh, uh, like around December and early January, I've been able to finally uh, start getting some of my uh, uh, backlog of stuff uh, 
that's been sliding and sliding and sliding. And uh, uh, so bottom line is I got into a, a software manager and I do this once in a blue moon uh, when uh, uh, maybe I'm uh, too burned out on my regular work and I need a uh, uh, distraction, but at the same time too, I want to uh, uh, just do some exploring. And sometimes that's with other distros of Linux or uh, uh, Windows uh, stuff. But in this case here, software manager. And what I started doing was going through just the categories here. And I kept coming across some things that I uh, uh, didn't know about at the uh, time. And so the uh, um, end result was I discovered a whole bunch of additional things by just taking a little bit of extra uh, uh, time when I was a little too burned out for regular work and uh, uh, started exploring this stuff. And uh, this is uh, uh, what you get with the uh, accessories, the category, and you get all kinds of uh, great little pieces of software in here uh, that frankly, uh, I either forgot about or uh, um, just didn't know about, or maybe there are new versions that I didn't know existed uh, previously. So from uh, uh, what I'm trying to get across is from time to time, it's well worth it going through each of these categories just to see what's going on. Even flat pack, you can find out uh, uh, what now is currently in flat pack because it's constantly changing it's improving over time and uh, uh, they're giving more and more packages but like uh, uh, the one guy uh, uh, that we last uh, heard from flat pack and snap pack take up a lot more storage space than uh, uh, the traditional installation of the application but i'm finding more and more of the traditional uh, packages that i might have installed no longer available you have to go to flat pack it's just one of these uh, uh weird things now uh, i bring this up also in the hope that some of you uh, uh, in future meetings will uh, bring to the attention of uh, uh, everybody who joins the meeting uh, some of the uh, uh, packages you found that might be of interest to other people. And I'm really counting on everybody doing uh, this. Bitwarden I use, but I haven't used it in Flatpak. Uh, at the moment i use it uh, uh more and more in my windows environment uh, over LastPass because LastPass has slapped on uh restrictions that didn't exist for well more than a decade so it's kind of like uh, macro reflect going to a subscription service but LastPass is only uh i think three bucks a month or something like that but nonetheless, if you don't want to uh, uh, play the game, then there are alternatives. And Bitwarden is a, a, a decent uh, alternative with at least one uh, exception. In LastPass, I have uh, a lot of large, secured, encrypted notes that I keep track of uh, information on that I have not uh, uh, yet been able to transfer to Bitwarden, which has a smaller format. So that means I have to break up a lot of big notes into a lot of smaller notes in uh, Bitwarden. And I haven't gotten around to it because I ain't got enough hours. Uh, and now that I've got a bunch of cats that I'm trying to get rid of, including uh, uh, 
there was a, a, almost a fight in here a couple times and that's because I got one troublemaker that uh, the former owner of eight cats didn't understand cats didn't understand this one was a pain in the butt I had it trapped uh, 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 twice and it still got loose in my house. I haven't been able to recapture it. So that's a project in itself. Then I, I want to uh, uh, adopt it out and let it be somebody else's problem. Uh, but anyway, uh, back to Linux. Uh, it's, I'm still playing with the LMDE from time to time. Um, and really, I do uh, uh, find more commonality between uh, regular uh, Linux Mint and uh, our uh, good old uh, uh, LMDE 6. Uh, 6 is an improvement over 5, which was a big improvement over 4. And God knows what uh, 1, 2, and 3 were like, which I uh, uh, didn't know existed until around the time of LMDE4. Uh, one other thing that I want to bring up that was touched upon in the videos is that um, when you come up, um, and I uh, recommend this in Snappack, always hit the refresh. But periodically, if you do not update uh, uh, Mint frequently, do a refresh before you do anything, even if it tells you I've got one, two, three packages. Hit the refresh. You may find out you've got a whole lot more than what it's showing you, or you may find a screen that says you got to uh, um, download and install a new installer package version, and then it will show you everything that's available. And that's a real important uh, uh, factor. Also, under edit, if I want to upgrade uh, uh, to uh, uh, 21.3, and I'm thinking of doing that uh, uh, in the near future, is uh, uh, this is a way of getting to it because it used to be you went to uh, system reports in the uh, menu. Well, it's only there for a short time, and they may have stopped putting the update in system reports. So if you come to the update manager, edit, you'll find the upgrade available, because I originally skipped 21.2. But with all the updates that you normally get anyhow, it didn't matter. You still ended up on 21.2 at the present time anyhow. And right now, 21.3 pieces of upgrade are coming into even my 21.1 uh, 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 that's got a, a, a now a moniker of 21.2, even though I didn't do the upgrade. And I'll be uh, uh, eventually seeing 21.3 before... Uh, the next version of uh, Mint comes out. Also under View, you have kernels. And if you want to update your kernels, here's a, a, a warning. Do uh, 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 heed the warning. Click uh, Continue. And these are the ones. Now, I consider uh, uh, 6.5 to be uh, kind of bleeding edge at this point. Uh, the other guy did uh, uh, 6.2, uh, which seems to be working fine. Uh, and I would uh, uh, say that that's worth uh, considering. Uh, the uh, 5.190 said was obsolete. Of course, that makes uh, 5.15 the default uh, kernel for 21.3 very obsolete. So you, if you're uh, uh, interested, I would back up uh, my system first before I change my kernel just to be on the safe side.
And it doesn't matter whether you use uh, something like Time uh, uh, Shift or uh, uh, Clonezilla, uh, Rescuezilla, uh, or some uh, Mac Ream Reflect uh, uh, Rescue Media will do the backup. And I'm sure uh, uh, something like uh, Easy Us uh, to Do Backup and its Rescue Media would do pretty much the same thing Mac and Reflect uh, Rescue Media will also do. So these are some of the little tidbits that I came up with uh, in the last uh, uh, week or so uh, that uh, uh, caught my attention more than uh, uh, some of the articles that I have uh, uh, done in the past. And I'm not done uh, uh, doing other articles but I think uh, some of us need to be looking at that software manager uh, when we get a little bit of time and seeing what's out there. And you might uh, uh, surprise yourself, Ned, that there's a package out there that you might want to explore. And if it turns out to be a, a good uh, uh, package for you, bring it up to the rest of the people at uh, uh, the next meeting. It uh, uh, behooves us to keep expanding this stuff and uh, being able to uh, show people there's a lot to offer in the Linux environment and Windows isn't the only game in town, nor is Mac OS or the BSD uh, versions, which are a, a micro version of Unix operating system that most of us probably would not mess with because we didn't come from a Unix background. So does anybody else have anything uh, specific they want to uh, uh, discuss? Okay, you're on stage. <laughs> uh, two things. I'm going to lower that again. Have either, since we're down to the three of us. Well, Bob Baxter has, uh, leaves has, early. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so has either of you two uh, used a, a video capture software from Linux, in Linux to capture live videos from the screen? I have used OBS in the past, but OBS has changed a lot. I have not retested it in Linux, but I do use it even as we speak in Windows environment, both 10 and 11. Uh, 10, I uh, uh, let go for a while and I did have some problems with it. I think I'm back on track there. Uh, I will eventually get uh, uh, it working again on a uh, uh, Linux base. It's a, a case where I have a whole lot of settings in the Windows environment and trying to get some of them uh, transferred uh, to another machine, it doesn't matter what the OS is, can be a headache. So it uh, can be very time consuming for me to uh, uh, have a uh, a transition as it were but OBS did work uh, I would recommend if you're gonna play with it uh, try flat pack uh, uh, version uh, it may give it uh, uh, some additional uh, stability but when it went uh, uh, to uh, I think it was uh, uh, version 2.9 uh, from the prior version it changed a lot of things. I didn't see what it changed. And so I lost either video and or audio or both in uh, my uh, recordings, which uh, uh, means that some of the uh, meetings I was trying to record didn't get uh, uh, recorded by me. Uh, and if they didn't uh, come out good in Zoom's recording, we don't have that meeting uh, recorded anywhere. Uh, right now, the reason I have uh, uh, two uh, Tim K's out there, that's two different systems running OBS, 
now uh, in version uh, three. And uh, not, uh, take that back. It was 29 and 30. And it's now in 30. And it still uh, uh, threw me a couple curves. But I was able to catch it on one system uh, quickly. But uh, it turned out there were some different idiosyncrasies in 10. So I didn't catch those right away. It took a while to get those all ferreted out because what happens is uh, some of the settings that you have to set up in OBS link to your hardware devices, such as what your web camera is, your uh, a web microphone, your speaker systems, and suddenly when there's a major version change some of those things break and you have to uh, uh, realize that go in and uh, uh, check those things out and try and uh, uh, get them working before you need them anything okay. else peter so You've put around with LM. Pardon? You've played around with LMD6. Oh yes, I've got a, a working uh, uh, version of uh, uh, six. I got uh, uh, both the 32 and 64 bit. This is the 32 bit uh, uh, version here, and I've got uh, over on a, a different machine uh, the LMD6. I've also played with the five and the four. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm on LMDE6 right now in this meeting. Yeah, uh, it's a, a very good, solid base. Um, so is a regular Mint based on Ubuntu. Both are uh, fine uh, uh, versions, but you got to understand LMDE uh, uh, version because it's based on Debian, one of the original Linux distros. They are super conservative people. Change is slower than molasses in January in some respects. If you want bleeding edge, you go to Arch Distros. And behind that would probably be the RM, uh, uh, RPM based systems like uh, uh, Red Hat, uh, Fedora, uh, OpenSUSE, and uh, then uh, you get into uh, Ubuntu versions, which are based on Debian, but they go with, uh, like uh, uh, the one person said, they go with the uh, more exploratory versions that may not be as stable as Debian likes in its official SID releases. And so the end result is you can have instability issues just like you can have in Ubuntu. And those can bleed over into regular Mint and all the various uh, other uh, distros that are based upon either Ubuntu or Mint. So you can have more advanced features, newer stuff a little sooner, but it depends upon your characteristics, your needs, as to whether you need that uh, uh, more advanced uh, stuff, taking a slight risk for instability issues, or you uh, stick with something like LMDE, it's going to be very rock stable and only make a major update every two years versus these uh, uh, little uh, incremental steps that regular mint does like 21 to 21.1 to 21.2 to 21.3 and eventually uh probably april may something like that we'll probably see uh mint 22 and uh who knows when we'll see uh lmde7 but right now both are rock solid that's what, uh, 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 actually, I like that uh, uh, Veronica, uh, like I said, play the video at full normal speed, and she is a fast talker. 
but I like her idea on laptops having a slot in the side where you can uh, uh, pop out uh, your uh, uh, NVMe, plug in another one with a different distro on it, and uh, uh, start the uh, new system up and uh, get going again. It reminds me of old uh, IBM ThinkPads. You had that same similar kind of capability when it was uh, uh, spinning hard drives. Well, Damn comment on that. I I am someone who uses uh, SSDs in external enclosures. Right. They are very readily swappable. They're not hot swappable, but they are swappable. Right. And I... Uh, with the ever-growing uh, availability and popularity of pre-manufactured, pre-built external SSDs, I think that uh, comment in the video is somewhat out of date. I disagree with you. Uh, uh, I would like that idea pretty common. I use the externals too. I've got uh, 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 this for an M.2 uh, format. And I also have, uh, though I can't grab one right this second, I don't think. Yeah, here we go. I've got uh, uh, this two and a half inch uh, uh, form factor as well. So, I mean, I've been using externals. I also use uh, the uh, straight cables that uh, uh, will give you a, a USB 2 straight into a, a, a two and a half inch drive just like this there's right. something almost identical yeah. uh with uh m.2 factor as well i uh, don't happen to have one of those though but uh, uh i've seen them so i know they're uh, readily available yeah it uh, it depends upon each individual user um most Users are not into the hardware like I am, and to some extent, you too, as well. Yeah. Uh, even Peter uh, uh, is uh, uh, fairly into hardware, but that tends to be uh, on the rare side. Uh, my being, uh, uh, besides hardware, I'm into the operating system and tools to uh, uh, maintain backup uh, uh increased performance of the operating system etc i'm much much lighter in the applications that most people want to use whether it's an office package suite of some kind uh with uh, uh, microsoft office being the biggest uh and most complex uh, uh version uh, uh, out there to learn especially if you want to uh, uh, try out every bell and whistle. Uh, by the time you uh, go through uh, all the uh, programs, the bells and whistles uh, uh, one time, they've already probably changed uh, everything twice. Yeah. So uh, bottom line is uh, uh, that's why, uh, especially like Microsoft Office, uh, most people, if they uh, uh, learn and use 10% of what you're paying for, it's a miracle. Because most people don't have uh, enough dedication and uh, great memory for all the idiosyncrasies of all the features that are available in a Microsoft suite. Whereas uh, you get uh, uh, LibreOffice, uh, WPS, uh, Open, uh, 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 Office and a few other uh, packages, they are more condensed. They don't have as a fraction of the bells and whistles, knowing that most people are not going to go deep into the packages and learn every little nuance that uh, yeah. Microsoft does. I, a little side note on uh, LibreOffice, I, whenever I see really old versions, even the uh, age of the version that is by uh, standard in Ubuntu, I, I usually go over to the Document Foundation, uh, download their uh, 
archive of Deb packages sorry, for LibreOffice Fresh or Community. And I, even though I may not be getting much out of it, I like to have a more up-to-date version. Uh, I, uh, I'm not that concerned on being with the latest, greatest, always. I mean, as an example, I still use Macrum Reflect uh, uh, 8 Free. Why? Because it's rock solid. And there's a lot of uh, pieces of software out there. Uh, for example, there is another group, uh, a, a person, he is recommending our clone. And our clone now has a, a GUI interface uh, for our clone. But the developer of our clone has not done any uh, changes or updates to our clone for at least a couple years. And he was very upfront about it. But it's so rock solid, and he's been using it for uh, uh, a year or more without any issues. He still recommends it uh, regardless because uh, the way it's built, I have never seen uh, an issue with Macro Reflector. I go back to version, I think the last version of uh, 4 uh, that came out, and then it uh, uh, fairly quickly went to 5. I went through all 5, 6, 7, and uh, uh, 8 uh, uh, as far as it's going on free. And I have a subscription service. I only use that on some of my 11s because there aren't enough licenses that I have to cover all my Windows 11 systems with the uh, subscription version. So I still use free on a few of them. It's rock solid. Uh, uh, I don't uh, uh, worry about, uh, uh, I, if I was going to worry about something, it would be a case where uh, the possibility of a piece of software and Macroom Reflect qualifies where it was free. They wanted you to make a paid version. Now they're going subscription. Well, what if they decide that's it? We've had it with this. Uh, it's not working out for us. We need to make money. And they uh, pull the whole product all together. I Macrim Reflect will not do that. Well, I'm just saying, what if they did? You could have... A... I, there have been companies that have done that. That's right. I, of course, we've seen some all do that. That's right. And but so... I, that's only because they were not able to get people to pay for it. That's Macrim right. Reflect is doing pretty darn well about getting people to pay. I understand that. I'm just saying. Uh, I gave it as an example because I know you have it and I have it. And other yep. people, uh, uh, even through my recommendations, have been using the macro reflect. Uh, the sumo, yep. I uh, wasn't totally sold on it. I tried it out a couple different times. Uh, still, at the same time, uh, I'm sorry to see it go, but this is a, a, a potential life thing. Uh, uh, things come and go. I mean, uh, uh, look at all the versions of Windows that have come and gone. Uh, everything has its time, and eventually you have to say, uh, well, we got to move on. And so you went from XP to uh, Vista. That was real popular. And then uh, uh, they uh, uh, cut back on Vista to 7. Then they went to 8, 8.1, 10. 10 is uh, 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 less than two years left on it. Uh, unless you pay money to get updates, unless they change their mind and give a, a say one to two year extension at no additional cost. Uh, they did it on XP, they did it on seven. They might do it on 10, but I doubt it. Uh, then you have uh, 11. Come next fall, they may be releasing what may be called still Windows 12. Uh, nobody's uh, uh, saying that's absolutely going to be the name or not. And that's going to introduce an option of subscription to an online desktop. I, what 
basically Windows 12 as understood currently what it would do is it would have a base operating system that everybody gets and only by paying subscriptions and going with cloud apps you could get additional features particularly some of the advanced AI features right and uh, you gotta understand with AI uh, it's uh, there are a few trying to create limited local on your computer AI, but if you want real AI, you gotta uh, uh, be hooked up to a, a supercomputer, basically speaking, which is the cloud. And, exactly. And uh, uh, whereas the local one that some are trying to create only uh, uh, follows and tracks what you do on your computer through the browsers the history of what you do and it will use that information in uh, giving you an ai intelligent answer for what you have come across that is basically what has been uh, happening with things like copilot right and uh, uh even now uh, uh firefox which some keep uh, uh, saying is a dead horse, uh, but it still keeps going, is going to create uh, their own AI uh, uh, package to uh, be part of Firefox. And then they have no choice. They have no choice. Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, if they don't, uh, uh, they really will become a dead product. And uh, uh, then you have all the spinoffs. You have Chromium. Uh, which is the foundation of both Edge and Chrome, but you also have something similar with Firefox, with, uh, with Water uh, Fox, Pale Moon, uh, Libre Wolf, are three that I know of off the top of my head. They're all based upon a, a Firefox browser. But they are usually not as up-to-date and as advanced. That's uh, they give uh, uh, in a sense. It's kind of like uh, using Debian version versus uh, the regular Mint based on Ubuntu. You're going to get more features in the uh, uh, quote flagship Mint versus uh, the Debian LMDE version. Uh, in a sense. If you want the most uh, uh, recent stuff, you use regular Firefox. If you want a more stable version uh, with less bells and whistles, you use Waterfox, Pale Moon, Libre Wolf. Uh, that's supposed to be uh, pretty private, but a lot of people uh, uh, tout uh, uh, incognito mode and similar uh, type modes. Well. That doesn't stop uh, 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 the company that develop it from tracking what you're doing. They just uh, uh, don't let some other people see what you're doing. Well, uh, that's one of the reasons why a lot of people go with either Brave or uh, if all the people used to be going with Opera, but that's pretty much dead. Yeah. Peter, you got something? Yeah, I got a question. Now that we're, when I saw the on this machine it was 21.1 and now we're going to 21.3 do i need to refresh the install media always uh, uh when you're uh, thinking of trying to uh, see uh, uh, if a new version is available that you want to upgrade to like the 21.3 always do the refresh it's got to pull in whatever the current uh, outstanding updates are regardless and uh, uh, if you only upgrade once a month as an example always do the refresh before you do any install and that way you always see okay. the latest greatest all right yeah and in terms okay, of the so install it's not, media it's not that it's, it's let, let to to recover yeah, uh, the, the install media, or if you need to recover your system, I I use Ventoy, so I, what I do is I just simply replace the older ISO with the newer ISO. 
and, and Ventoy will mount it for me. Yeah, and uh, uh, what you can do too is uh, uh, time shift, which uh, uh, some will recommend at the point where you're going to do an upgrade, have it going, and you can have that time shift go to an external drive, which uh, uh, for most of us anyhow, we only have one at most two drives in our systems, unless you have an old tower like I have some, and very few of them have more than two drives anyway. So I would go, uh, in fact, I have, I don't have it uh, readily available right now. I've got a uh, external housed uh, uh, drive strictly for Linux, and um, it's a, a terabyte drive. I split it in half uh, with Gparted. Half of it is for timeline for a given computer and half of it is for uh, regular backups that I, I use either uh, uh, RescueZilla myself, or I could also, if I want to, use the Rescue Media from Macrum Reflect, as well as some of the other things that I've uh, brought up in the past. I Most people who use Linux do not clone and do not do image backups. Why? Because you can have a home or user data partition, and that contains your user documents, your photos, your videos, etc., and it contains a lot of your uh, per user settings. Everything else, we like to get a fresh install and start fresh. Yes. And the other thing you can do Synaptic allows you to save software markings. So it will reinstall with the latest versions that it has available everything you installed that got registered with it. This does not include app images. It may not include it will not include Flatpak. It oh. will not include anything you side loaded from a PPA. But otherwise yeah. it contains all your repo specific software. And you can save the markings of your installed software, or you can save all the markings, or you can save markings for tr problem packages, because it does uh, it does all of that under a, a, a little tab called status. And uh, uh, see, uh, 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 Peter, uh, I'll bring up another point here. <laughs> under uh, uh, Mac OS, they have timeline which is the same thing as time shift and now under windows 11 they have finally a new backup application but not everybody's going to like it uh because what it does is it backs up your system on the fly to OneDrive, and a lot of people don't like that concept uh and uh, part of uh, uh, the reason for that is uh, even though OneDrive added oh, a year or two ago um, a vault feature, which means everything in the vault is encrypted, uh, OneDrive by and large by itself is unencrypted. So if you're backing up, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, if you're not careful when you're installing 11, you'll end up backing up all your uh, documents folder to OneDrive. And if you want a local copy, you have to download it. It is something that uh, uh, can be turned off, but most people don't know that happens to exist. Now, why do you want to have uh, the equivalent of these three uh, types of backup. The biggest single reason is they are ongoing, on-the-fly changes to your system so that if, uh, uh, as long as you don't get hit by ransomware that uh, uh, encrypts all your stuff, including uh, your uh, time shift, uh, stuff or timeline 
or this uh, MS backup, you're okay. And so uh, 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 I think with the MS backup and OneDrive, it would stop ransomware from encrypting stuff out on the OneCloud. But that's not necessarily true of timeline or time shift. And so you have a, a situation where uh, you could be at some risk, but if you only do an image backup, which is all I do, is I do it once a month at most. And uh, uh, that means anything after I've done the backup that I do in the way of changes on my system, I don't have a copy of unless I take a flash drive as an example and I back up everything that changed to the flash drive. Then I can restore my uh, image backup and then I can take the files that changed on my system and uh, uh, copy them back to the restored uh, backup image and theoretically I should have almost everything that took place. With uh, time shift, timeline, uh, you might have uh, almost 100% uh, restoration as long as it didn't get encrypted by ransomware or something like that. Now the question you always have to ask is, do I want to be able to roll back to exactly where I was just before I did this stupid thing? <laughs> or do I want to give myself an opportunity to put the whole thing together properly and with fewer errors than I had even at that point? That's true, too. And that's, and that's one reason why a lot of people who use Linux professionally will simply salvage their user data and rebuild everything else. Yeah, and uh, there's a good point to that. But the, uh, in a sense, uh, if uh, depending on how much you know of Al Cheeks, uh, generally speaking, uh, I don't know if, uh, uh, what he's doing anymore. I haven't seen him in a long time on uh, any of the meetings. Uh, it was a case where uh, Al would take and... Uh, Every six months, he would blow away the uh, a whole installation after backing up just his data. We might want to wait for Pete. He All dropped right. out. All right. I'm back. Al, Al okay. Uh, 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 what he would do is uh, uh, every six months, back up all of his data and uh, uh, at least uh, some of his settings, etc. What programs... Uh, uh, he had installed, he had a list, uh, uh, I'm assuming it's a manual list, not uh, something like uh, Sumo was. And no, it would be a list like what I do, where I go into Windows, I'll go into All Apps, yeah. and I OCR that. Yeah. And I, in Linux, I like I say, I will do Synaptic, and I will keep a manual list of anything that I did some weird install or sideload of. Right. And uh, 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 it's just a case where uh, Al did this because in Windows uh, it uh, uh, gathers cobwebs. And part of it you already found that I've known for a very, very long time, but I know how to take care of it without blowing away my system and doing a reinstall. Right. And uh, uh, one of the major ones is... Uh, 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 Win uh, S uh, X Win side by side. Yeah, side by side, and it's a, a, a case where that keeps accumulating tons and tons and tons and slows you down more and more and more. The registry can get the same way, and yeah, uh, so, you, you get accumulations of manifests, and I sometimes driver install packages, mm -hmm. and you will get accumulations of Windows update install packages, and you will get accumulations in the registry of registry values. And each time you install, uninstall, or modify or update software, or change some of its settings, more and more of this garbage accumulates. Mm -hmm. 
in Windows, we have well-known tools for cleaning this up. Pete, what you may not know is that in Linux, we have tools for this, too. We have Stacer, which is one of our favorites. Mm -hmm. Bleach Bit, which also works in Windows, mm -hmm. although it's a different program in Windows. And I... Uh, in Linux, I, in Ubuntu, we have Computer Janitor, now known as Ubuntu Cleaner. But that only works in Ubuntu and its flavors. If you're using a Debian-based Linux, you would not use that. There's uh, other stuff in the Debian repository. I just found one more that I want to check out before I tell you what it is. Yeah, and it's okay. a, a, a very common uh, uh, thing that tools will change from time to time if you're on windows okay a lot of employees work on projects on github which is also owned by uh, microsoft. microsoft as a, a developer's base and they created uh, 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 power toys which is a great little uh, uh, tool and our uh, suite of tools and it keeps improving at all times they also now have pc manager which is a single front end that pulls together a whole bunch of individual tools that go back as far as windows xp maybe even older than that so i kept saying when that uh, when i found out about uh, pc manager is that uh, uh, it's 20 years overdue, at least. Maybe 30 years overdue. So it uh, uh, depends upon uh, um, each individual, but tools are uh, uh, constantly changing. Uh, in, Linux, in Linux, you have a plethora of tools at the command terminal, okay? A lot of people hate and detest that concept, uh, thinking back to MS-DOS, even though in Linux, it is a multitasking environment, meaning you can have multiple things going at one time, not one thing at a time. But you gotta remember all these options, all these switches, and uh, uh, really, you only remember a small portion of them and when you know you need something that isn't part of that small subset you have to go look at the manual pages and find out some of the extra features that you now need perhaps a, a one-time need so you have that factor but a lot of people out there who are developers they create graphical user interfaces for a lot of these uh, command line tools and the end result is you have a better tool bleach bit was brought up by bob fine bleach bit works on windows and it does a, 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 a it has improved and it does yeah. a pretty darn good job of cleaning out a lot of trash that uh, uh, all the other applications I run for cleanup leave behind. And usually, yeah, would... and you've got to be really careful with Bleach Bit. Oh, yeah. Because you can check off stuff that will clean out almost everything. It'll almost do uh, that legendary thing that uh, Ed Keating tells us yes. about. Mm -hmm. where you do this uh, special command yes. and it will wipe out your entire file system. <laughs> That's your, uh, and I mean everything. It wipes it all. <laughs> but uh, uh, it, Bleach Bits isn't uh, uh, that bad. But see, unlike some people, a lot of people in their browser, they uh, 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 always start off with a fresh session in the browser. I always set mine to continue where I left off when I shut down the browser or shut down the system with the browser still running. It remembers everything that I had. In BleachBit, I uh, uh, have to uh, turn off the check mark for sessions or it will wipe out my previous stuff. And right. I'd be real ticked 
Also down in some system settings, there's two things I disable there as well because uh, one of them is uh, uh, free in memory and the other one has to do with uh, 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 wiping uh, your space. traces uh, uh, in your uh, uh, free space area. Free disk space yeah. by, by uh, system-wide logs because that's so slow. And I... The other thing that you uh, said about die, free memory. It wasn't the free space; it was something else. Free memory. Free memory. Right now, after. I do the memory cleanup, but what happens when I do it? Because I have sixteen gigabytes of memory, and I have fairly advanced onboard graphics. I what will happen is. If any program, including the desktop environment, has been uh, using memory segments, they will be freed up and the, they will be cleared. And temporarily, the whole screen is going to go black or you'll get bumped clear out to your login reader screen. And then you have to come back in. And uh, if you try to run any other program that is going to try to make use of the retained contents, of protected memory, like uh, LibreOffice, it will crash mm -hmm. until you log out and log in again. That's one reason why I uncheck that one. Yeah. But I do <laughs> check it because it also will clean anything in memory that might be malicious or that might be adware. Well, So uh, there's pros and cons to that. Also, I, what I want to mention about BleachBit, there are folks who really don't like it because it cleans out logs, including crash reports. Unless, unless and you, these are important to developers. Unless you uncheck them. If you uncheck right. them, it will leave them alone. It's, right. it's basically speaking, when you're going to use a tool, check things out and find out, hey, yeah, this thing, if I uh, leave a check mark here, is going to get rid of my logs, and I'm a, especially a developer, or I'm having a, a, a lot of problems that the log files are uh, uh, accumulating information about the problem. Uh, that's a, a no-no. Uh, but uh, uh, otherwise, on a normal basis for most people, you'd still put in a check mark, get rid of the old logs. And who cares? You're freeing up space, and yeah. so you gotta uh, 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 take everything with a grain of salt. That's why in Bleachbit, what I like is in the major categories, it will tell you a bit about each of the settings, which a lot of uh, uh, utilities don't do. So yeah, Bleachbit uh, it's great. like having a whole bunch of man pages inside the app. Right really good to have yes and i think we have another question from pete yeah he just okay. keeps so where i was really going at and i brought this up before the actual meeting uh is i've got possibly two or three desktops at the school that i'm going to do a, a study session with probably the eighth graders and the high schoolers in the school, it's an after-school program, one with all the latest version of Linux on. Have them install it. So one thing is on Linux, how do I burn burn a USB stick with an operating system with the Linux op? Okay. Current Linux. Pete, let's circle back to Ventoy. Do you remember how we had? the utility Ventoy, which would create two partitions on a USB flash drive. And the first partition is basically a boot, an EFI boot partition with security certificates for certain operating systems. The second part of it is just a launcher. And it'll launch and play live any of a number of ISOs, including installers including the utilities. And I just toss on there things like Gparted and I uh, 
several Linux distros, the live installer ISOs. These ISOs can be played just exactly like media. And uh, they can be used live. And then when you're ready or the students are ready, they can just hit the install and say, uh, usually you'll go down to the something else option, set up your partitions so that you have an EFI boot partition for Grub to sit in. And the other thing would be, for most people, it would be root, although we've discussed doing other partitions. And I uh, then just uh, let them work through the process. Now, also, too, I want to mention, uh, it was uh, at least a year to two years ago, Ventoy uh, didn't have uh, a way of saving any of your... Uh, uh, anything that you were doing, any uh, changes you were making uh, with the ISO image. But they added persistence uh, uh, capability to Ventoy so that, uh, for example, in an ISO... Well, wait. <laughs> in an ISO uh, uh, image on uh, uh, Ventoy, uh, what you uh, uh, might end up doing is uh, uh, creating it with persistence so that you, while you're in the live ISO image, you're going to set up your uh, network uh, access, whether it's uh, uh, Ethernet or Wi-Fi, it doesn't matter. And it will save it, the settings, in the persistent area and that's very important otherwise every time you run the iso you got to reset up your network every single time if you download a program that you play with or uh, are trying to learn on uh, a linux uh, iso it will not be saved unless you have persistence storage set up for that iso yeah i tim i think what i pete was talking about was just simply i uh, giving the students i uh, the empowerment to do the actual install of the operating system onto the computers they will then use yes Is i understand that correct that, part? Pete, but uh, uh yeah. again the persistence part though if you're going to uh, uh, use the ventoy it's advantageous in the early stages of introducing them to have the network set up and the settings remembered so you're not having to play with that part every single time. If you uh, want to uh, uh, have part of the ISO image, bleach bit as an example and stacer as an example, then you want to have the persistence available so that that is also available when they do an install. Yeah, there's just one caution about this. If you try to update or upgrade software in a persistence environment, you're going to be taking up more and more space on the drive. Yes. And uh, eventually you're going to have to clean it up. Yeah, uh, the best thing uh, there is not to do the regular updates on the ISO. Only uh, uh, your setting changes that you want and uh, uh, things like uh, uh, tools like a bleach bit, uh, a stacer that you want to include in an installed installation. All, let the, uh, uh, after the installation is done, then you walk through all the uh, recommended setup changes that Mint will bring up on the first page, and you walk through every single one of those to uh, uh, show them what that's about, get everything set correctly, because if you ignore it, you're going to uh, uh, regret it uh, in the uh, short term. Okay, so uh, when I created my, my last uh, install media for Mint, for Mint, 
is a 21.1. Okay. When I downloaded it, it it already had G parted and all that stuff burnt in on the ISO. Yes, uh, a it. lot of distros. So I could just plug that in, and it would go in direct, and you could get G parted. You could change everything. Well, yeah, there's there's a lot uh, of stuff included. There's a, a lot of distros that give you a lot of tools. There's a lot of distros that give you next to nothing, and you have you uh, get those because you have your own uh, tools that you like using. You will install them on the new system right away. But yeah, it, if we're sticking with the uh, the beginner types of distros, right? Like Ubuntu, Mint, or uh, some of those others, uh, they generally do include enough tools. tools to get started. Yes. And uh, I, I remember when we first started, it didn't have, we had to put all of that stuff on the, the drive to do it. Well, uh, no, uh, we used, uh, uh, just a minute, uh, 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 Peter, uh, some of the tools uh, uh, had to be done uh, separately so that you could set up the environment easily because within the installation process they use a more primitive tool okay now in the live media you have g parted i would recommend using that or discs and in either one of those tools set up your environment first on the target then do the installation uh, 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 and it'll be uh, much easier because the partitions are already there. You just have to know this is the uh, EFI partition. This is your root partition. You have to set a flag that uh, designates it as root. You have another partition that's home partition and uh, you can either use the uh, internal root a page file system or you can set up your own swap partition i prefer the uh separate uh, uh swap partition in other words you have to create the partition structure before you populate it that's right aware aware i'm aware of that and, so uh, I, but see the I've thing had that, that, five or six times if, if yeah, that, that, that's why that's yeah. why that's why we run gparted separately than the installer. Yes. And because see, the installer, while it can do all this, it well, uh, doesn't really do a good job of showing you what it's going to do and where it's going to do it unless you already have it set up. It's very primitive, uh, uh, but it is doable. I've used it before, but I'm not going to try and explain that to a noob who has no clue what you're talking about. No, you don't explain that to a noob. <laughs> it's bad enough trying to explain uh, uh, discs or G parted and what you're doing and why you're doing it. And then on the install, how do you uh, uh, put stuff in the correct partition that you created with those uh, uh, external tools? And then you end up with uh, uh, the system you want when it's all done. Yeah, and trying to explain to people who have not been used to working with partitions and who don't know how computers boot, if they don't know the technical details, trying to explain what an EFI boot does and why you need certain flags on the partition, I yeah, good luck with that. Just yeah, you just tell them you do need these flags. That's Otherwise, right. it's probably not going to work. Yeah, you're not going to get what you want. Be... <laughs> and uh, uh, see, the thing is, with the uh, the live ISO, uh, Peter, if you can still hear me, uh, you can always do a simple install that makes a single blob of the entire operating system. So, uh, uh, generally speaking. Uh, again. Even though it's doable, it's undesirable for a lot of reasons. And one of them uh, uh, Bob has uh, brought up, I brought up before too. If uh, uh, you hose up your system enough, 
Well, okay, you might have to replace uh, uh, the EFI and root partitions, but your home partition may be left totally alone and you don't have to worry about it and it's you're back in business. Yeah, a separate user data partition will usually survive just yeah. about anything bad that will happen right except and, for an entire disk failure and uh, 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 in many cases if you take the windows concept of windows users for the most part they will only back up the library entries like uh, uh, documents music uh, uh, pictures videos and almost nothing else but then they uh, make changes to various applications and the operating system, and they don't have those changes that they made. So when they have to reinstall everything from scratch, A, they don't have any of the uh, uh, settings that they were using at the end. B, uh, uh, they probably don't even know a fraction of the software they had loaded on their system themselves and they've got to uh, uh, figure all that stuff out and then put all their data uh, uh, stuff back in the proper locations i say good luck to most of them you most of them just uh, uh, say screw it and they start from scratch and take the loss so so the the other thing is that the install media that i did not Loaded for this one allowed them to run off of the USB stick until they were ready to actually install. Yeah, that's called the live session. Yeah, and the live. And that's what that's where we're saying if you do a live session and you've set up persistence, then you can save some settings, and uh, that way you can come back to where you were when you left off. Right. Uh, so just, other words, just don't. Work, and do... I give each one their own. Just a second. It, and I give each one their own their own. You. Yeah. Stick. USB stick. That a USB stick. Right. They could then create a persistent. No, when you so created. I'm in the classroom because I've only got three. I don't know how many kids. They could plug yeah. their stick in. It would boot up to that. Yeah, and unless they actually did a hard install, it would run off of that, so they could learn. Question, yeah. question, Peter, okay. and it's important. Who is setting up the live stick? You or the student? I would probably set up the live stick. Okay. Okay. And you have to set up the it. persistence. When you create the live stick, I understand yeah. that. So, in other so, words, sorry. So, when you run Ventoy, it has the install script, and one of the options is to create persistence right then and there. Right. And uh, uh, see, the thing is, uh, once you set up the persistence, you just got to make sure they understand. Do not update the Linux updates on the live stick. It'll yeah. eat up all that persistent space fast. Yeah, just do not run updates within that live well, environment. I expect them to do the first one or two sessions. No. Off the... No, uh, don't do the update at all. Ignore the updating of oh, Linux. No. You, got no. wrong. you got me wrong. The first one or two classes, they'll work off the stick just right. so that they get a feeling for the system. Right. And the third class, they do a real install. Right. Yeah. And then Good idea. Start. Good idea. Good idea. On the real install, that's when you show them how to do uh, uh, the changes at the initial uh, install. And part of that is updating Linux updates yeah yeah agreed yeah you teach you teach them about updating i uh, you know the first round of updates you teach them that on maybe the third session 
after they've gotten a feel for so, what it's like in the live so environment. The Frozen again. <laughs> Man. We're back again. Yeah. You sure about that? <clears throat> anyway, I, 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 until Israel, Israel flattens the, the continent over there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I turn to laugh. Yeah, I. But anyway, I. The point is, uh, yeah, the first couple of sessions, I uh, you don't have them doing any updating inside that environment. Right. And when they finally install it, then you teach them about updating. Yeah. See, the uh, live environment yeah. is a learning environment to begin with. You can play around yeah. and do no damage unless you happen to have persistence set up and they go and do the actual Linux update. Then you got to hit it. But as far I, I'm as. I'm going to have to do persistence because I'm going to have to set up the network because I can't give them the key to the wireless network. Right. Understood. That's you set up the credentials. And that's why you also want that persistence, because when you set up the uh, uh, network access, you aren't showing them anything. They just have access right. to the network. Yeah. So the network access, when they get this USB stick, they've already got that, because you put that in with persistence. Yeah. It's one of these uh, uh, cute things, and I'm glad uh, 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 they finally got on uh, the ball uh, with persistence. I had seen it in Rufus' portable version uh, a long time before that, and then finally uh, uh, Yum and uh, uh, Ventoy, which uh, are kind of the same ilk, Yum uh, was first, and Ventoy came along with some uh, uh, bells and whistles of their own. They uh, both added persistence also, like yeah. Rufus uh, Portable allowed. But unfortunately, uh, it's still a case where uh, Rufus Portable only works correctly on 10. So far, it does not work uh, the same way on 11. Well, there's always well, I'm like... <laughs> working up to Linux probably at 21.3 when I update the one at the school. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the that's my machine at, at school. Yeah. So I've got to practice everything on the machine here, not on the Windows machine. Yeah. On the machine here. Because mm -hmm. I have very limited time over there. Yeah. The sessions are like from 2.30 to 4.30. Yeah, make sure you know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, you don't want to experiment. You cannot be the blind leading the blind. Uh, uh, yeah. But the LMDE is also a viable option uh, besides regular Mint. Uh, uh, it's just uh, uh, you'd have to learn that uh, uh, idiosyncrasies of that version. But otherwise, mechanically, it's almost the same thing. For educational purposes. See, so, so the real... The deal here here is is that I get them on Mint, right? Yeah. And but there are there, two versions. Have, they can get another another di installation disk, and they can install LMD if they want to. I because yeah, I think not, uh, I think for people just learning, I uh, regular uh, Ubuntu based Linux Mint will probably be around long enough for them to learn. And uh, I they agree. can just start with what everybody knows, and everybody knows it works. Right. And uh, uh, now yeah. that uh, uh, LMD6 is out, at least that's another viable option if somebody wants to go that route for more stability. Yeah, if they want to do it that way. The, and less the, the thing is, if I get a, a star, a, a rising star, he wants to, he or she want to play, yeah. since these aren't the actual school machines anymore, they can do whatever they want, as long as they stay in a safe zone. Yeah. Yeah. So, more, 
more advanced <laughs> users can do more advanced things. Yeah, they can. So, so these are going to be high schoolers. Yeah, they tend to be adventurous. Yes, <laughs> uh, uh, very adventurous. They tend to be adventurous. <laughs> so, and probably eighth grade high school. Yeah, that's about the age it's at which they like audience. to do some experimenting. <laughs> and you want to be able to recover from the experiment relatively reasonably. I. That's why you should always keep a base image handy and be ready to just roll back to it. Yeah, I. That's there used to be a program. There used to be a program called Deep Freeze that, after a session, would just restore everything to the base image. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of a lot of colleges and high schools use that, but they. But that's been discontinued. That's been discontinued. But I, actually, in Linux, you can do something similar. I, uh, you can I, uh, create a base image and then just have it uh, roll it back at the end of uh, the day or the end of the week, whatever uh, your schedule is. You could even make a scheduled task out of that, and maybe use time shift. There's lots of options, uh, 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 more so than Windows, but uh, uh, Windows, especially with 11, and I assume 12 uh, eventually uh, when it comes out, uh, the amount of change bothers a lot of people. Uh, to some extent, uh, even though MIT is not as uh, uh, bad as maybe Ubuntu at times, um, still makes quite a bit of change okay mm -hmm. and uh, uh so that bothers people so the people who don't like much in the way of change lmde is uh, uh, a viable option yeah you can do it uh, you can do High it either way don't care about change well uh, i know that. don't care about change. no they don't care if you change stuff i okay so have we gotten you uh, enough information and advice so that you know something about how to get started, Pete? Yeah, I think so. Well, okay, Tim, anything else we want to cover? <laughs> oh, I think we covered uh, uh, way too much. <laughs> okay, I'm yeah. going to be uh, uh, turning off the uh, video. Okay. <laughs>